We're live right now, by the way. I'm just getting some stuff pulled out. Okay. Wait. Shoot. Okay. All right. How's everybody doing? All right. So, everybody, today I have with me Stephen Bennell, a.k.a. Destiny, and Caleb Maupin. Uh, so, uh, I got a message on Discord from someone that watches my channel, and they suggested Caleb. They said that he would be a good person to debate uh, socialism with Destiny. So I've got them both here today, and we're just going to go ahead and jump right into that. So if you guys want to introduce yourself, Destiny. Oh, I'm not hearing. I'm not hearing him. Are you not hearing him? Just kidding. I'm sorry. Oh. Can you hear me now? <laughs> there he is. Wait, Caleb, could you hear me before? I can hear you right now. I hear you as we were I heard you way before. earlier. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, gotcha. At okay, the very yeah. beginning? Hey, I'm Destiny. I play video games, and I sometimes talk about politics and sometimes philosophy, and whoa, 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 whoa. that's what I do. Okay. There you sure. go. Okay, well, I'm, I'm Caleb Maupin. I'm a journalist and political analyst and an advocate of 21st century socialism. Okay. So uh, how do we want to go first? Do you uh, maybe want to define some terms? Um, Caleb, well, maybe you want to go ahead and define your terms sure. on what socialism is? Well, I want to start out. Now, can I call you Steve? Is that how you like to be addressed? Steven? Yeah, Steven is good. Yeah, sure. Okay. Whatever. Well, I really like what you do. I'm a big fan of your channel because I love the United States of America, and I'm deeply worried about the future. And the fact that you are facilitating discussion that is civil, you're not encouraging people to go out and punch each other and get violent over this kind of thing, but we're having civil intellectual discourse about very important concepts. I really like that. And I, I'm really honored to be here, and I'm glad you've taken this opportunity to engage with me. And I thought I might begin this debate, actually, by quoting some of the words of a very radical socialist, uh, who existed back in 1892, he wrote these words. I think some of the viewers may be familiar with these words. They go like this. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. The author of the Pledge of Allegiance, Francis Bellamy, was a socialist. Furthermore, Abraham Lincoln had a general, a brigadier general in the Union Army named August Willick, who was not only a socialist, but a personal friend of Karl Marx and corresponded with him throughout the war. Roosevelt frequently met with labor activists, progressives, and members of the Socialist Party and the Communist Party at the White House. Um, and this notion that somehow, if you believe in socialism, if you believe that the banks, factories, and industries should be organized to serve public good and not profits, this notion that that somehow makes you un-American, or makes you a foreign agent, or makes you a traitor, or somehow opposed to what it means to be an American, this is a fiction. It's a fiction that's been peddled by William Randolph Hearst, by uh, Rupert Murdoch, by Roger Ailes, but the truth is that socialists have been an important part of U.S. history. We organized to oppose slavery. We were supporters of Abraham Lincoln. We organized to build the labor movement, to build the suffrage movement for the right of women to vote. We've always been part of this country, and I think that advocating common sense rather than the irrationality of profits is a fundamental part of, of U.S. experience. We've always been around. Um, in fact, the word socialism, uh, which you know was first from the French, Henry St. Simon, the utopian thinker, coined it in French. But the first person to use it in English was Robert Owen. And Robert Owen set up a utopian community in Indiana. And he spent a lot of his life in Indiana building the settlement of New Harmony. So... We have always been part of the United States, and I will add that when socialism comes to the United States, it will not be Russian or Soviet socialism. It won't be Chinese socialism or Venezuelan socialism. The socialism that comes to the United States will be a socialism rooted in our own traditions, our own history, our ongoing struggles here, the struggle for democracy, the struggle for equal rights. It will be an American brand of socialism rooted in addressing the issues we face here in this country. And I think it is high time we start engaging about these ideas. I, I object uh, to the way socialism is widely characterized in the media. And so let's talk. 
Um, okay, I just want to get a couple things out of the way real quick um, so that it doesn't feel like I'm uh, either backpedaling later or, or radically changing this. I'm not sure how much you know about me or what I do. Um, I don't care about America at all as a country. I am not like uh, married to the idea of the United States. I don't really care much about like uh, making America like the best place. I, I don't know if I'm just because you're I know that your pitch is like pretty nationalist oriented here. Um, I don't care if the author of the Pledge of Allegiance was like a socialist or like a capitalist or whatever. Um, typically, when I'm when I'm looking at like economic systems, so uh, ways to organize our economy, I'm usually just trying to find ways to generate the most amount of wealth, and then hopefully to redistribute later redistribute it later on using like tax policy or some other type of thing. Um, I just want to get that out of the way right now that I don't have like sure. any type of like strong nationalistic bend towards the United States. I'm not like allegiant to any particular country. Um, I just happen to live and pay taxes in the U.S. Um, okay, yeah. So getting that out of the way, um, yeah. I mean, I guess we can jump. I, I guess right into the the socialism thing, or how, how do you want to do this? I mean, is that question directed toward me? Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. Well, I yeah. mean, go right ahead. Um, I think it's important to clarify what we mean by the terms. So, if you want to begin with that, I think that's a great place to start. Um. Yeah, sure. So I've heard socialism described in a lot of ways, um, all the way from some people saying that some redistribution programs are socialist. So like people will point to like Sweden and go, hey, look, you know, they do a lot of social welfare. That's socialism, um, which I don't think is necessarily true. All the way to people who say that like even co even cooperatively owned firms don't count as socialism. Um, that's just, you know, uh, that's you still have firms. You still have people that are working for profit. They're just distributing it to themselves. That's not real socialism. Um, so, I, yeah, I guess I, we can move policy by policy point or you can give me like what definition you're working under or. Yeah. Well, that's a very important thing because there's a mm -hmm. lot of definitions of socialism these days. You talk to yeah. two different people, they'll give you two different definitions, right? And I think mm -hmm. a lot of this is because of the Cold War. It's because of there was such a McCarthyist atmosphere of hysteria. And there was so much of accusing people of being socialists and communists in the United States that it's all gotten muddled. If you watch Fox News, I think Obama was labeled a, a Muslim and a communist and a fascist and a socialist. You know, there, there's a lot of confusion. Um, and I think the reason, for example, that many people associate socialism with just general social welfare programs is due to the fact that, that throughout since since really since the beginning of the Cold War, if people get up and say, hey, you know, we ought to have health care in the United States for people to be provided for free. The response to the right wing, you can't do that. That's socialism. Right. If people say, hey, I think we ought to provide college education to people in the United States. You can't do that. That's socialism. That's that's communism. That's so so we have a generation of young people that are coming up and the economic circumstances are a lot worse than they were during the height of the Cold War in the 50s and 60s. And it's basically, you know, the little boy who cried wolf. Uh, they say, you know, oh, you can't have free health care. That's socialism. They say, fine, I'm a socialist. You know, and that's really what's going on with the Bernie Sanders debate right now. And I think it's amusing. And it shows that the hysterical anti-communism has kind of taken the, the, the taint off the word or the uh, the onus off the word. People aren't afraid of the word anymore. I think that's good. But I must say that socialism is not the government spending money. It's not progressive taxation. Uh, that kind of thing goes on in every society to some degree or other, right? Uh, you know, I'm sitting here in New York City. There's roads outside that are paid for with wealth that was redistributed from me, the taxpayer, to build the roads. New York City is not socialist because of that, right? Some countries redistribute a lot of wealth. Some countries redistribute a little wealth. Uh, income inequality, uh, you know, these things happen in every society, and that's not the definition of socialism. The definition of socialism that was the definition of Karl Marx, that was the definition of the Bolsheviks, that was the definition of also the British Labor Party and social democracy uh, up until like the 80s when, you know, they removed Clause 4 from the British Labor Party's constitution. The understanding of what socialism is that has really been the key definition that's been around for hundreds of years that has been obscured in the aftermath of the Cold War and all this confusion. Socialism is a society where the centers of economic power function on the basis of what is good for society and not simply what is in the interests of private owners. Capitalism is defined as a system in which profits are in command. Under capitalism, this is Frederick Engels, he said the means of production only function as preliminary transformation into capital. Or Mao Zedong, he famously said profits are in command, profits in command. Socialism is a society where the major centers of economic power, the banks, the factories, the major industries, operate according to what is good for society overall. And that is the fundamental difference. Is production 
being carried out simply in the interest of profit, or is the state planning out the economy in order to ensure that growth can take place? That is the difference between capitalism and socialism. Okay. Um, so when you say socialism, are, so are you implying like a fully planned economy then? Now, well, you'd have to define what a fully planned economy means, right? Planning so, goes on even under capitalism. A capitalist will plan uh, how he wants to do things in order to make his own profits. Uh, I think that, the, there's, there, that, that term needs to be defined. Obviously, the Soviet model of doing things where everything, almost everything is run by the government is not coming back. Right. Yeah, that's I mean, kind of what I'm just trying to figure out. Like different. We've seen it different in different places. Uh, you know, the Bolivarian socialist model that we've seen developing in Latin America, the Baathist Arab socialism of the Middle East, uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics in China, uh, the socialist oriented market economy of Vietnam. They all do things very, very differently. Um, but at the end of the day, in all of those countries and situations, the economy functions based on what state central planners say, not on what is in the short-term interests of private owners. There are private companies, there are private corporations, but even the private companies there do what is in the interests of society. They're told what to do by the state. Um, and I think that's that's the difference, right? And that, that I would argue that, that one of the things we've learned from the Cold War is that you need a market sector to some degree. I don't think the government should run, you know, for example, uh, hotels. I don't think the government should run restaurants. I do think the government should run heavy industries. I do think that the government should run health care. I do think the government should run banking. Um, but, you know, I, I think people should be able to start their own business. You know, you know, there's there's not an opposition to people that have their own idea and are creative and go out and, and invent something new. Um, in fact, I think that the aim of socialism is to strengthen that. If you look at Nicaragua right now, the government, the Sandinista government is working very hard to facilitate micro entrepreneurs and loan money to private citizens in order to build their own businesses in coordination with the overall state central plan. Um, so, and the same thing has happened in China, obviously, Deng Xiaoping famously saying that market socialism was necessary and that uh, you know poverty is anti-communist, but to get rich is glorious. And, and that I believe socialism in the United States, I would suspect it's not really gonna be up to me. Revolutions aren't made by guys sitting on YouTube uh, making comments, uh, but, it's not ultimately going to be up to me, but I would expect that in the United States, a country where entrepreneurship is really valued and individual initiative is really promoted, that a market sector would be part of what we develop. And worker co-ops, let me add, are part of a market sector. In a worker co-op, they're looking to increase the profits of this individual firm, but they all share in the proceeds. And you could argue it's more efficient, right, because every worker wants to do as best as possible because they get a share of the profits. But worker co-ops are still part of the market sector. They're not, uh, um, you know, part of, of the government apparatus, right? So I, I think that needs to be cleared up. I think worker cooperatives are great, but they're not the essence of what socialism is. As you've pointed out on your lives um, and on, on your, your videos, uh, worker co-ops compete with each other. Worker co-ops seek to maximize their own profits, right? That, that, that's not the essence of what socialism is. It's a good thing, though. I think worker co-ops are good, but socialism is when the economy is not functioning according to the anarchy of production or the chaos of the market, when profits are not in command. That is what socialism is. Okay, so Caleb, you're not suggesting that like markets be done away with completely, nor are you suggesting no. like full central planning in your model of socialism. Okay, Destiny, you wanna to respond I'm to that? I'm saying markets should be subordinated to the interests of society overall. Okay. What is, what is it, wait, so, okay, so I'm curious, hold on. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to write this down. So I'm just trying to figure out like how you decide, like what would you, what, what do you think should be centrally planned? Like what is the answer to that? So you have some industry, what is like your thought process for like, oh, this should be something where we, you know, the government figures out like who can produce what, how much should be produced and how it should be allocated. Like how do you, how do you figure that out? Well, I, I think you're kind of missing the point. And I understand why you're, you're going here, because I've watched a lot of your streams and you're debating often with people that are very utopian. And you want me to sit here. It's almost like the Seinfeld episode where I sit. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Hold on. Wait, wait. I'm sorry. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Can I please? I mean, this is. Go ahead. Is, Go ahead, Destiny. It's not going to be up hold to on, me wait. whether I think this industry should be nationalized or not. That's wait, 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 wait. Socialism okay, doesn't hold, arise let, let, from let, ideas and human minds. It arises from contradictions in society. And at some point, we are going to need, uh, you know, the society overall to take control of the centers of economic power. Capitalism is out of control in the United States, and we will move towards socialism at some point. I'm very confident of that. But it won't be up to Caleb sitting here in, in front of his bookshelf in his Brooklyn apartment as to what it will look like. It'll be up to the American people and what they want. So go ahead, Destiny. Okay. I'm sorry. So just really basic question. I'm just curious, how will you decide 
or how would you decide? I'm not saying that you're like a totalitarian dictator and it's up to you, but I'm just saying how do you decide which industries or which parts of your economy need to be planned by the government? That's all I'm curious about. That would have to be up to the political leaders that are elected. That would have to be up to the political parties that are formed. That would have to be up to the community assemblies that are m built. Any transition towards socialism requires bringing millions of people into motion and bringing people into the political process. Um, okay, wait. If that, involved, if that, if that, it would have to be a decision that involved a lot of people. It wouldn't be up yeah, to if that's, one leader sure. declaring it from above. Okay. In that case, I think we're going to agree on everything that you say because we're already in a socialist society. We've just decided not to centrally plan anything. Like that answer doesn't really tell me anything, right? We've already got leaders in charge that have decided not to centrally plan stuff. And if how we centrally plan stuff is determined based on what the leaders say should be centrally planned, then I guess we're already there, right? Um, I, w I would beg to differ with that. Um, okay, so then how would you... It's like that profits are in command of the U.S. economy. Uh, no question about that. Um, I think... If you look at the United States as it is at the current moment and a lot of the problems that are developing, there's no question that profits are in command. So I, I, I wouldn't argue that. I would argue that I think what you're getting to is that socialism in the United States could only come about if there was mass involvement by the people and it couldn't be simply declared from above. And I think that's a very important point to make. And I don't disagree with you on that. And if the American people in their millions wanted socialism, we would start to move in that direction. So I think you're, you're on point on some regard, but uh, I, don't think, I don't think you're exactly getting the point either. Okay, so I'm not trying to say that you're doing a utopian thing because clearly you're aware of that. But like, so I'm trying to figure out like, this is just like a really basic question about like how would you plan your markets and you're telling me that you would plan them in the interests of society and how it's voted on but like these are nice answers to say for anything like I could argue like oh like a fascist society is going to be great and you'd say well how it's like well because we would vote on things that are in the interests of society like well what does that mean right. like there has to be some metric or whatever rubric by which you evaluate whether or not your society is successfully organized in some socialist manner like how like how what does that mean well, in the past, I have put forward four steps that I think would basically transition the United States towards socialism. If I mean, okay. I think yeah. if we were to carry out these four things, the United States would go from being a capitalist country to having a socialist economy. The first would be a mass infrastructure program in which millions of young people were hired and put to work rebuilding our bridges, uh, rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure, uh, rebuilding our educational system and universities, and developing the country, and, and getting us to a situation where we don't have water that's not being properly purified, uh, you know, we don't have power plants that are crumbling, um, and, and just rebuilding the United States. Secondly, I would say that oil and natural gas and coal and timber and these natural resources uh, would be declared to be public property and managed in a way that was in the interest of all of the country, controlled by the state, and not operated and owned by people with names like Carnegie and DuPont and, and, uh, and Morgan and Rockefeller, who simply operate them in the interest of their short-term profits. And that would be pretty good for the country, because right now we're having an oil and natural gas boom. We are producing more oil and natural gas than ever before, but yet the very states that are producing it, places like Pennsylvania, places like Ohio, where I come from, are getting poorer while more and more wealth is being extracted from the country. I don't think that's right. Third, banking would need to be in the hands of the state, right? Uh, the, the lending of money should be done in the interest of what's good for the community overall, not what's going to make a return or a profit for some banker. And fourthly, I think that it would be necessary to implement the economic bill of rights that Franklin Delano Roosevelt proposed uh, in his final years as president and start working to make sure that every every American, every U.S. citizen had access to health care, had, had access to a, a job, was put to work doing something useful for society, uh, you know, and, and implement that economic bill of rights, uh, health care, education, employment, etc. And if we did those four things, uh, it would be pretty clear that, that the economy would be functioning in the interests of society overall and the state would be controlling the centers of economic power, the means of production. Okay. Um, do you want to walk through these one at a time, I guess, so we can kind of chat about them? If you want. Yeah, sure. let's do that. Yeah, sure. So for the first thing, like a mass infrastructure program, rebuilding bridges or infrastructure, um, I mean, I don't disagree with this. I don't know how this gets us um, anywhere closer to socialism, though, right? Like increasing like city or state budgets for repairing roads and whatnot. Like all of these are typically contracted out to private companies anyway. Is there like something else that you wanted to go along there? Or is that just like the like, kind of like the standard rebuilding our infrastructure program? Well, I'm glad you agree. Um... And um, let's move on to the next one. 
Um, okay, <laughs> number two, for the for the oil and natural gas should be public property. Are you talking about would you just like expropriate these things and like disband the uh, companies, or how, how how would you go about like taking over these industries? Well, that's a good question. I know in some socialist societies they have compensated. You know, we have eminent domain in the U.S. Constitution, um, for example, where they they buy them at market cost and make them public property. Other socialist societies have seized them without compensation, and that would again not be something up to me and I, I i that would be up to what people thought was in the interest of the whole society yeah wait so real quick whenever whenever i ask you a question i'm asking you how like ideally it would work I, like appealing to like well that's just what the people would vote on doesn't right really but answer you're trying anything. to set me up to say oh no i would send the troops in to take it and then you go totalitarian i got you oh and that's not you know and, and i'm i'm saying here i don't know and that i would want things to be done as in peaceful a manner and as smoothly as possible I have a feeling that those who own these big oil companies and those who own these fracking conglomerates and those who own these big Wall Street banks wouldn't be so peaceful and agreeable. But I personally think that we should do things as peacefully and democratically and smoothly as possible. I am for a peaceful transition. Okay, so, okay. So I'm sorry if you feel like me asking you like incredibly simple questions about the four points you've given <laughs> feels like setting you up. I'm not trying to set you up. Um, if at any point you feel like a question is unfair, um, you can tell me if you want to ask me the same question about capitalism sure. or how I would envision a system working ideally. You, you can feel free to ask me the exact same question. Um, I, given that you've laid out these four points and, and you've had ample time to speak and it feels like you've prepared a great deal for these sure. types of talking points, I think it's fair to ask a couple of incredibly basic questions like how would you steal property from the people that own it in, in, in a, like a reasonable manner? And I don't think it's fair for you to say, oh, well, it's just how the people would vote on it because it doesn't really answer my question at all. And it kind of seems like you're um, you, like you're a little bit unwilling to engage with like a pretty easy question related to like a talking point that says we need to take all of the capital from these massively like privately owned companies that exist on our markets, that hire private employees that, you know, like represent like a great deal of like the American economy. Well, I'll repeat what I said before and say that I would favor it being done in the most smooth and peaceful manner possible, perhaps with compensation. Um, I would prefer it be done legally. I would prefer it be done perhaps using eminent domain under the U.S. Constitution. Um, that's that's what I would favor. I would favor it being done in a smooth, peaceful manner. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that every other socialist necessarily feels that way, but that's how I feel. Okay. Um, like eminent domain is one way through which you could acquire businesses. Um, I, I would push a little bit harder here and I would ask, what would you do if the people would refuse to sell? But it might sound like I'm setting you up for a totalitarian <laughs> answer, which makes me feel like you're like implicitly acknowledging that at some point you wouldn't care if you had to kill capitalists to take their stuff. Um, but I mean, we don't have to deal with that, I guess. Um, in terms of like actually like planning out like how these industries would function, um, so right now like firms respond to market demands, right? They allocate more resources where they feel like there's more profit to be made. Um, just kind of a basic question, I guess. How, how would you decide like how to run these companies? Like when do you stop producing oil to export to other countries? Like are you trying to make as much money as possible? Do you balance out like environmental concerns with people concerns? Like how do you, how do you plan this out economically since you're not using a market-based system to do it? If you expropriate these industries. Well, obviously, we would have to be hiring the smartest economists and the smartest brains in the United States, the, the best engineers, the best technicians, to oversee something that's probably the most fundamentally important thing in the country, ensuring the economic prosperity of the people. Um, now, that leads me to when you said that I was a nationalist, and I want to be clear, I am not a nationalist. Wait, wait, wait. Nationalist oh, to be clear, I didn't say, I didn't say, yeah, wait, to be you know. clear, I didn't say you were a nationalist. I just said okay. it sounded like earlier you were trying to appeal to me being a nationalist. I'm absolutely not married to the idea of America <laughs> okay. or capitalism. I don't, like, intrinsically care about either of these things. Just okay. making sure that I have that clear, okay? Okay. Yeah, but um, I, I would think that you would have to assemble the smartest minds and the, the most well-educated folks and you'd have elected leaders who would pick out the smartest people and they would do their best to make sure uh, that the economy continued to function and grow and they would oversee the rational planning of the oil industry of banking and such how do you balance out things um, so like in the United States right now for instance we have a lot of conflict between labor unions and um, and like environmental I guess uh, like environmental regulations um, in, in this like quasi technocracy or whatever, where you're like voting in people that choose like the most 
um, I guess, educated engineers or whatever to plan this out. Like, what what values do you expect these people to be like maximizing for? So, for instance, like just a few days ago in LA, um, I think we have like a massive solar farm that's been approved, but one of the leading like uh, like the oil labor people that work here are dramatically against it because when they bring these solar farms online, they're going to be cutting uh, power to a lot of the oil factories here, and obviously all of the labor there is like highly opposed to that. Um, how do you resolve like these types of conflicts in, in your system? Well. I, I want to address that issue because global warming is a huge problem and sure. and we need to tackle it. But my disagreement with the environmental movement, and I think this is where the conflict between labor and the environmental movement you know, originates, is that a lot of folks in the environmental movement seem to argue that the answer to global warming is an end to historical progress, that we just have too much stuff, we all need to use less, conserve. I would disagree. I say that the answer to the problem of global warming is technological and scientific progress. We need to get off of fossil fuels. We need to develop fusion energy. Uh, we need to talk about, you know, hey, I don't, I think it's actually something we could realistically think about is, is getting resources from the moon or getting them from elsewhere in the solar system with our space program. Obviously, that would require huge technological leaps. I'm, we're no, not there, there yet, but we should be there. Marxism is an ideology that is fundamentally about historical progress. And I think most environmentalists, unfortunately, the prevailing attitude among the environmental movement is that there is something wrong with historical progress. And it's the Tower of Babel that we've gone too far. Um, and so that would be my thoughts on that particular disagreement. But how would it be handled? Well, it's something that, that would have to be resolved and that you would have to pay attention to what people in the labor movement said. You'd have to be paying attention to what the environmental movement and the leading scientific voices would say. Uh, there would have to be democratic procedures. So the will of the population overall was seen. Um, I, I can I can see why this these kind of disagreements would take place and they do take place. And if you look at socialist societies around the world, obviously, many of them are not as free and open as we are here in the United States. And that's that's something that I, I have criticism of and I'm not advocating anything totalitarian and dictatorial here. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's it's a conflict that they have. There were big disagreements in the Soviet Union. Uh, there were big disagreements. There are big disagreements today in China. Uh, these disagreements happen. Um, and, uh, you know, handling them is something that every government does. I mean, we have disagreements here under capitalism and our governments are handling them. Well, yeah, but the way that we handle, yeah, but the difference is that like, it, so in my system, so I'll, I'll try to answer the, the own question, how to resolve conflicts between sure. like labor or engineers or scientists is we basically have a market system that allocates resources in the places where we expect to make the most money, right? So um, for instance, if you would ask me, well, um, Stephen, how do you know whether or not you should frack in your society? My answer would be, well, we look at global oil prices. We see the cost of what it takes to remove these or extract these resources from the ground, and then when the costs um, fall below the profits that would be made um, up to a reasonable level for these things, then we would start to do it, right? That would that would be my answer for most things, because that's how like capital is like flows throughout a society, is to the places that generate the most profit. Um, if we're if we're doing like a form of central planning, if we're getting away from markets, um, then we then we have to appeal to something besides profits, right? Which is what it seems like you want to do. You want to get off of profits um, because profits don't always work in the public interest. For instance, it can be highly profitable to pollute the ever living fuck out of a river or to engage in horrible behavior that, you know, exploits third world countries or leads to other parts of it, which is absolutely a valid point. But my question is like, well, if we move off of like profit structures to do this, um, back to like my initial question, which I feel like I didn't get a good answer to, is how do you resolve your conflicts between your labor and like the technocrats that you kind of like put in place to tell labor like what it should do? So for instance, let's say that we, uh, let's say that we have like our elected leaders and they say, okay, well we need to figure out what to do about climate change. And let's say that there isn't like a magical innovation that's gonna save us, but we actually do need to reduce consumption. How do you resolve the uh, conflict there when your labor is not gonna be okay with shutting down all the factories that they work at? when the people People that work in these oil places, um, when you know you've got these massive unions in the United States that are historically opposed to a lot of these big like environmental changes, it's happening right now. Um, how do you resolve these conflicts? Like, who do you choose to side with? You side with the workers who want, who love their jobs, who love their factories, who want to be able to work in their places, who are more have more democratic control of the workplace, or do you side with the technocrats that are saying, well, actually, we've scientifically deduced that we need to cut these factories? Like, how do you choose which to value there? And you can't I, answer whatever we vote on. That's not a real answer. Sure, but I could also answer that that would have to be decided on a case by case basis. Um, you yeah, know, but what, by I what? What do you appeal you, to you're, decide? You're giving me this very obscure hypothetical and asking me what I would do, and I'm telling you I would need to look at the specifics of the situation, and I'm also having to unfortunately deflect back to it wouldn't be up to me, which I've said many times, and that's not satisfying you, and I understand that, but 
But again, I mean, you're giving me this very, very obscure hypothetical, asking me how I personally would do it. And I feel like we're way far away from the issue of socialism versus capitalism at this point. Is there maybe an example or something that you could bring up, Caleb, that uh, would be satisfying? Well, well, can I actually, I can, I mean, we can talk about this. So the the obscure hypothetical that I'm presenting you is what do you do when there's a conflict between labor and scientists that say there is some damage that's going to happen here? So, I mean, I can answer this hypothetical incredibly easily. Um, You have a government that is in charge of putting forth policies by the EPA. Maybe we determine that there's some amount of like carbon pollution that's bad for the environment. So we put a tax on that carbon, something like cap and trade. So it becomes unprofitable for you to engage in behaviors that are hurtful to the environment to some level, right? Um, When you make those ventures less profitable because of how capitalism works, less capital will flow to those parts of the markets. Hopefully, as you tax something, you see a reduction in that consumption, and then the money flows elsewhere. So like to green energies or whatever. I don't think that hypothetical is obscure. I think that that hypothetical is actually reflective of a very pressing reality on the planet right now, which is how do we deal with climate change? Um, I think it is incredibly concerning if you're proposing an entirely new economic system and you can't like answer very basic questions about how would you deal with pollution? Um, or how would you resolve a conflict between people that work at polluting plants and not having those polluting plants if those aren't good for the environment? I think that's a very fair question to ask. Well, I I think it's something that would obviously be of deep concern, but I guess maybe what you're getting at is you're arguing that the way to deal with the problems of capitalism, and you're pointing to the problem of pollution, you're arguing is to regulate it rather than to take things into state ownership and have central planning. Is that the essence of what you're arguing with me? Well, yeah, it's a capitalist. Yeah, I'm generally pushing towards regulation rather than expropriation into national industries. Yeah. Well, I would argue a couple points on that. First of all, um, you know, the notion that uh, corporations should be regulated, I think is fine. And I think the private market sector that exists under under a socialist society would would definitely be highly regulated. Um, And and that would be absolutely necessary. But overall, um, you know, if, if an oil company was doing something that the workers wanted it to do and uh, the environmentalists didn't, um, you know, the, that would have to be resolved. And you'd have to have elected leaders who would decide that. You'd have to make a decision as the society overall. Um, but wouldn't it be better to have the entire way oil is run be up to the community from the beginning rather than just trying to catch up and put binders and guidelines on entities that are going to do whatever is in their interests of profit no matter what. And I think environmental issues are not not all the problem. The issue of, of you know oil and gas and timber and coal and these things being operated, the problem isn't simply that they're being operated in, in a way that is in the short-term interest of the owners and not the overall interest of the country and society. Um, I think the problem is also that the wealth that is being created from that and extracted from it is going into the pockets of big international corporations. And at the same time, our society is getting poorer. Um, and and that is a problem. Um, and I feel like fundamentally, and I think if you look at it, one of the biggest problems we have is that there is a section of society that is continuing to get richer and richer as our country overall continues to get poorer. Um, and that we see huge multinational corporations, we see big banks that are enriching themselves at the expense of the country. And that, that what is good for Wall Street is not what's good for people on my street or on Main Street even. Um, And you can look at this, the the great example, and this is, if you read Karl Marx, his book, Capital, one of the big things he points to is workers' competition with machines. Under a socialist society, self-driving cars would be a good thing. We'd be happy about self-driving cars, right? The, The people that now work as taxi drivers or truck drivers would be able to do something they felt was more rewarding. We wouldn't have to worry about that. In capitalism, self-driving cars threaten to put people out of work in big numbers. This is not rational use of resources. This is not rational. Uh, gr- another great example, you know, do you remember the, the 2008 financial crisis when mm-hmm. the housing bubble burst? What was that about? Well, American spending power had decreased and we simply couldn't afford to keep buying homes at the same rate as before. So Alan Greenspan and others in Congress deregulated lending People were being lend, lended money so they could keep spending and they could keep you know, taking out mortgages and do all kinds of things. And pretty soon the economy crashed, not because there was too much, uh, too little housing, but because there was too much housing. And in fact, people even became homeless because there was too much housing. This is not rational, right? 
in previous systems, under feudalism in the past, people starved because there wasn't enough food. People were homeless because there wasn't enough housing. But only under capitalism have we seen a situation where people are hungry because there is too much food, where people are homeless because there is too much housing, where abundance leads to poverty. And that is what Marx wrote about in his book, Capital, and it's public control and planning of the economy that prevents such a thing from occurring. It gets rid of this illogical boom-bust cycle, this, this, you know, this poverty amid plenty, and replaces it with an economy that functions according to a predetermined plan in the interest of society overall, with society controlling the means of production. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff. That's and, okay. Um, well, no. Well, the thing is that, like, I don't want to just talk about capitalism for 30 minutes. Like, I'm just, I'm very curious. Like, so my original question was, how do you resolve these conflicts? And I just got a whole bunch of stuff that wasn't really related to this at all. Um, so, for instance, wealth going into the pockets of big international corporations. Wealth disparity in our society is absolutely a real problem. And it is disgusting that we have, like, empty houses while we have homeless people or an abundance of food while some children are going hungry at night. Um, this has nothing to do with our economic system, though. Um, these problems have happened historically under socialism. Everyone in here knows that these problems are happening right now under capitalism of course um my, but like to, to go back to like the point like 20 minutes ago about like how do you resolve these conflicts between labor and 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 um and your scientists like you appeal to this question of like well shouldn't the community decide these things no i don't think so i would be like very nervous letting um so for instance like let's look at our like the federal reserve right i would be incredibly nervous if we were to take a public vote on interest rates i don't think that like monetary policy is something that i would want you know like my friend down the street that works at like a factory or that like sows for a living or something, voting on like our monetary policy. Um, I also don't know if I would want like the average Joe Schmo voting on what I want like our future like uh, climate policy to look like at some given firm. You know, um, I, I feel like you need experts in charge that kind of decide this stuff. It's not just like publicly voted on that, that appeal that we keep making to everything. Um, I mean, Brexit. That, that was a vote that society did. You know, I don't, I don't think that's going to turn out good for the United Kingdom or for the average worker um, in, in that place. Um, I mean, like a lot of the other problems that you pointed to, I agree, are huge problems. Um, I, I just don't think that this, the magical wand of central planning, I don't think this has ever worked before. Um, the idea that we can just centrally plan massive swaths of the economy. The Soviet Union tried it and massive famines happened. Um, other economies have tried it, like in Vietnam, and you've had entire shadow sectors, or in Cuba right now, that pick up in order to fill in all the gaps that the central planning leaves. These people that get paid under the table, that have these secret shadow economies going on underground to deal with all the stuff that the centrally planned economy can't deal with. Um, I mean, like, if that's the direction you want to push, I, we kind of, I guess we kind of have to agree to disagree there. Um, but I feel like historically, I, I don't feel like you have like good evidence to say like, oh, well, centrally planning like massive portions of an economy, um, you know, can, can be a really positive thing, you know, like expropriating some industries and doing that seems to work well. So for instance, Venezuela's gas, um, was ran nationally for quite a while and it seemed to do like really well. Um, but when they started to expropriate more communities, when they tried to hardcore set prices on things, it seemed like that started to turn into a big problem. A lot of the firms left the country. Country. They were unable to to actually supply its citizens with the things they needed, and I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I just I don't like this appeal to central planning. I just don't think it works or ever has worked. And I maybe if you wanted wanted to try to float this idea that like, um, you know, like using like AI or some complicated machine learning algorithm, we could do central planning. That would be really interesting. I never thought about that before, but maybe that could be more, but like like more probable. But having people voting on like how to allocate our resources, that just sounds like a recipe for disaster to me. Would you like me to respond, or do you have more? Um, yeah, go for it. You, yeah. Okay, well, on a couple of points, I mean, I don't disagree with you. Um, I don't think average Joe would want to vote on interest rates. I don't think the average Joe knows enough about interest rates, and he wouldn't even want to be given that. He would want to elect somebody who would appoint somebody to do that. I think that, that that's the reality. Um, and I, I don't think I'm advocating at this point any kind of direct democracy where everyone votes on every law. I don't think that's feasible at this time. Perhaps at some point in the future when technology has expanded to the point that, you know, people, you know, don't have to work that much or something, maybe something like that would be more feasible. Um, but at this time, obviously it wouldn't be. But when you say that socialism has never worked anywhere and statements like that get very widely made on American television. Wait, 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 real quick, wait, real quick, because yeah. you're about to, I don't care. I know you have a prepared answer to that. I'm not saying, I'm not using the meme, socialism has never worked anywhere to try it. What I'm saying is I don't think central planning has worked. My critique is much more specific okay. here, and I would be 
like if you have like I'm curious because I would have to go read more on them because every time I've tried to read on places so the only places I'm familiar with are like Vietnam or a lot of the older Soviet Union or some places in like Cuba like my understanding is that when we try to socially plan a lot of stuff you just can't do it there's so much for a government to keep track of it's bureaucratic it's slow you can't respond to changing market conditions so I'm saying central planning specifically doesn't seem to be a solution to an economy that that's what I'm saying specifically not like the socialism has never worked meme okay I'm glad you're being more specific than that um, but I would encourage you to read Maurice Dobbs' book, uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet Economy Since 1917. Um, Maurice Dobbs was a lecturer uh, at the University of Cambridge in Britain, and I have you know, quotations from the book right in front of me. In 1928, they launched the five-year plans in the Soviet Union. By 1938, coal production had multiplied by three and a half times. They had increased the rate of, uh, of electrification tenfold. Uh, there were 20 new tramway systems. The number of hospital beds in rural areas had doubled. Uh, the Soviet Union at that point was the largest tractor produ producer in the world, and they were the largest uh, locomotive producer in the world. Right? Um, this notion that, that socialism has only resulted in people getting poorer or making everyone equally poor is false. In 1917, Russia was an impoverished agrarian country. By the mid-1930s, they were an industrial superpower. They were a punk country that was strong enough to defeat Nazi invaders. They were a country that eventually invented That's, Hold on, a lot travel. of this is just not true. So they the Soviet Union was not strong enough to defeat um, the, the, the Nazi invaders. Firstly, in the early part of the war, um, the uh, Nazis were involved in lending a lot of things like rubber and other materials to the Soviet Union. And later on, the Lend-Lease programs from the Western capitalist nations were a large part of the reasons of why the Soviet Union was able to, um, to field as much armor and everything as they could. These aren't controversial claims. Lend-Lease was a mm -hmm. huge program that was massively successful to supply the U.S. with supplies. Alliance, an anti-fascist coalition. Um, sure, but, but it's Britain disingenuous to say that the, to it's Nazis dis on their own either. Sure, they but had help just, as well. The United I, States sure, had help. I'm not, I'm not saying that Britain, these that's are these are. Sure, these are what about, sure, sure. I understand that. These are whataboutisms that aren't relevant to what I'm saying is that the idea that the USSR was some strong superpower that on its own could stand up to to the Nazis, that is absolutely not true. They absolutely needed outside help. Um, first from the Nazis themselves, and then once Hitler turned on Stalin, then from other Western nations via Lend-Lease. Um, firstly, secondly, um, you're talking about like how um, the Soviet Union was able to, uh, you know, accomplish so much in terms of like uh, getting electricity, you know, out to rural areas and hospitals and all of this. This is just an industrialization. Lots of countries have done this under capitalism, um, under other economic systems, under socialism. Um, and also part of Russia's rush to industrialization led to massive famines that are to this day debated about whether or not they're considered genocidal. So I don't know if I like the idea of like, well, I can modernize a country if I tell everybody to stop growing crops, starve to death 10 million people and make some of them work in factories. I don't know if that's a good argument saying like, well, look how quickly we industrialized our country. Um, I, I don't know if I agree that that's a success of central planning. I think you can look all over the developing world today and see a lot of free market countries that have not industrialized and have not done what Russia and China both did during the 20th century, right? This notion that socialism never creates growth, it's never worked anywhere, all it leads to is people being poorer. Uh, look at Russia in 1917. Look at Russia by the 19, mid 1930s. Okay, hold on. We're back look at Russia by the 1970s. I, I don't, look I don't at China in 1949. Look at China today, the second largest economy in the world. That's a big fat lie. And I am wait, sick wait, of hearing I, it because it contradicts reality. Socialism okay. has raised countries up out of you're, poverty. Meanwhile, not, no, all no, over the this developing is not, world, are, I, this is like literal. Where these are like are still illiterate, where people don't have a basic electricity. Right? I, I feel let's, like I'm running down. Okay. That. Okay. Let's. I'm running let's, down like a dialogue tree right now. I'm talking yeah. about central planning. I'm not. I understand yeah. that you've probably heard a million times. Uh, socialism makes people poor or whatever. Yeah, I would never you make admit that. Admit that that's false. Well, no, but I, I would say that like the industrialization of the world, so much the same way when people say like, oh, capitalism is what is what's causing global warming. I don't think that's true. I think it's industrialization is what's causing global warming, right? We consume a lot of stuff. We produce a lot of um, emissions as a result of that. Like it's industrialization. When you talk to me about like, well, the living standards from the 1900s to the 2000s has increased. I'm not going to sit here and say, well, capitalism did that. And I'm also not going to say in socialist countries, socialism did that. Technological innovations, med medical innovations, um, agricultural innovations, like these are the things that have driven a lot of this. So I'm not giving you 
continue the meme that socialism hasn't helped any country, I'm sure that we can find, you know, whether we want to bring up Catalonia or other types of like smaller socialist societies that have existed to thrive for small periods of time. I'm sure we can find examples of that. What I'm saying is that central planning as a means of controlling an entire economy doesn't seem to be a realistic policy. If you want to talk more specifically about the USSR, we can, but I feel like that is not a good example for you to go to to show off the successes of central planning when millions of people starve to death in that society as a result of central planning. Um, I think millions of people starved to death prior to the Russian Revolution. Uh, as, as an agrarian economy, when there was a famine, people starved to death all the time. Now, you're, you're talking about specific famines that took place, but prior to the Soviet Union, uh, Soviet agriculture didn't have, or Russian agriculture and, and the surrounding countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, they didn't have tractors, right? Uh, it was the Soviet Union that mechanized agriculture. It was the Soviet Union that electrified the entire place. They actually had the biggest hydroelectrical power plant in the world in 1931, the Dnieper Dam. The fact that you gloss over the transformation of, of a deeply impoverished country into a country that was a superpower and is widely acknowledged to be a superpower, and you just say, yeah, but there were a bunch of famines, so none of that counts, that's, that's completely disingenuous, right? The whole world realizes what happened there, and the whole real world realizes what's happened in China. Um, and furthermore, uh, if you want to see countries uh, that have been part of our global free market capitalist system and how they've, they've flourished, take a look at Haiti. That country has NAFTA-style trade agreements with the United States. People meet, eat dirt mixed with oil, right? The amount of poverty there is pretty big, right? And that's a free market country. But no one ever says Haiti's problems are because of capitalism. But all of Venezuela's problems are because of socialism. Take a look at Nigeria. This is the well, so top oil-producing country in Africa. They have been doing business with Chevron and Shell Oil for decades, right? I mean, if, if, if oil and wealth and selling on the market would make them prosperous, they'd be a wealthy country. Their life expectancy is only 59. Uh, the rate of illiteracy is, uh, is, is uh, the rate of literacy in terms of population that can read is not even 60%. Right. Um, uh, the unimproved drinking water rates. Take a look at what the CIA World Factbook says about Nigeria, the top oil producing country in Africa. That's what the free market has to offer. Right. Free market capitalism is not industrializing countries. Why don't you compare India to Russia and China, for example? Right. India did not have a socialist revolution. It had a nationalist revolution. Um, it got its independence from the British. That was a good thing. But it did not have socialist construction or central planning and compare it to Russia and China throughout the 20th century. Compare the conditions of the people in India to the people of, of Russia and China, as, and, and you can look pretty clearly there. And in fact, a lot of the industrialization that has happened in India happened because of the Soviet Union and China, right? It was the Soviet Union built steel mills in India. The so I mean, China is now doing a lot of business there. So, so this notion that, that, that capitalism is industrializing countries. Um, you know, you can talk about the Asian tigers. I'm happy to address the Asian tigers. That's an example. But, I mean, all these immigrants that are pouring into the United States on the border right now, countries like Honduras, free market, capitalist country, where there are people that don't even speak Spanish, people don't have running water, people don't have electricity, Guatemala, you know, take a look at Mexico. You know, these free market countries have been looted and destroyed by international corporations. Whereas countries that have central planning have raised people out of poverty, they've industrialized, they've electrified, they've wiped out illiteracy very consistently, despite the problems. And there are big problems, I don't deny that. Okay, so I, I obviously I don't know the history of every single government in the world, but like based on some of the examples that you've given, I'm like incredibly suspect of the other examples um, that that you have given. So like when you talk about like people don't blame Haiti for um, capitalism, but they do blame Venezuela, right? My understanding of Haiti is there are a lot of corruption problems that exist within that government. It's not literally just they tried capitalism and it's ruining the country, but then people <laughs> do blame Venezuela. Well, that was because Venezuela like very specifically started to make socialist pivots. In in its economy. It started to nationalize more industries. It started to wait. Which part of that do you disagree? Do you do you, do you disagree that they were expropriating industries? Do you disagree that the they tried to hard force that price ownership control? Ownership in Venezuela is actually much lower than the rate of state ownership in China. Other than wait wait wait, oil, how is that a response? No no no, you wouldn't compare other the than state the oil. Of very little is nationalized, and I've been to Venezuela. And one of the biggest problems they have is that their economy is entirely centered around oil. And when the oil price dropped in 2014, that caused a huge amount of scarcity. They they need to have you know farms. There. They need to have steel manufacturing there, and they don't have it. If they had state-run big steel mills and state-run farms and all of that, they'd be in a much better shape. Um, okay. 
if we if you want to at a future de debate i would love to come back and talk about venezuela because i am positive that your assertions there that it was just because oil collapsed that that's why that country fell apart is absolutely not true and that no person well, that has been involved problem as well. no not corruption that it was very specifically Okay, it was very specifically pivots towards trying to socialize or nationalize or expropriate parts of their economy to set incredibly restrictive price controls that caused capital industry to flee that country, that caused some firms to no longer produce goods that or provide goods for its people. This is one of the large reasons why Venezuela's well. It's not just because oil prices fell a little bit. You don't see other OPEC so countries. Ran, you, an oil you, producing country, a huge oil producing country, bigger oil reserves than Saudi Arabia than I've heard. The oil prices drop. And at the same time, they suddenly start having big economic problems, but it's unrelated. It's all just because they believe in socialism too much. That's what you're saying? Um, like oil price drop of 2014 was dramatic. At that point, you could buy a, a family meal at Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, that would cost more than a barrel of oil. The petroleum like sector accounts for roughly – sure. So I'm just looking this up. Sure. I, I'm literally just – I'm looking this up on the fly because I know you're you're very incorrect. The petroleum sector accounts for roughly 87 percent of Saudi's budget reserves, 90 percent of the export's earnings, and 42 percent of GDP. That's petroleum in Saudi Arabia. And Venezuela – Oil is Saudi more... Arabia had big economic problems as well. Saudi as Arabia didn't have pictures of families eating rats off the street because their economy tanked so hard. I don't because have people not allowed to... from Saudi, Saudi Arabia, Arabia the, the that they're in the country that are guest oh. workers, slaves. Uh, okay. Saudi Arabia, you couldn't take a picture like that. And Saudi Arabia uh, has had big economic problems during that time. Sure. Okay. So um, look, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious. I just, I'm just Nigeria curious. Had problems. Oil producing countries all suffered as a result. Sure. Of they did suffer. I, go ahead, and let, uh, Destiny. Go ahead and ask. Get the your fact point. Fact that in. Venezuela didn't. Are you going to make the claim that Venezuela suffered just as much as every other OPEC country did when oil prices fell? Is that the claim that you want to make? No. So why does Venezuela suffer also support? suffers from sanctions from the United States? Venezuela also has big problems with corruption, and they also have the problem that they don't have. You said that that the problem was they they already had steel manufacturing, they already had big farms. No, the problem is they don't have it. It's a one commodity. Why economy. is that relevant? That is why does that matter? You don't need to produce every good that your society consumes. Uh, if if that's if your entire economy is centered around oil, right? and you are importing all of your food and products, and then you get sanctions imposed on you. And yes, there are big problems there, and they've manifested themselves. And I think it's interesting, though. Now, you acknowledge. Now, what I think is interesting about your Venezuela narrative is the narrative I normally get from people about Venezuela is that everyone has been poor and starving ever since they had socialism there, and that proves communism always fails. That's not the narrative that you have. You've, you've admitted that there were economic successes there until a certain point. Now, why does the media lie? Why don't? Why can't they admit what you just said? Why? Why? I don't do you know. know. I'm not. I'm not here to said. talk as a Fox News correspondent. I'm just curious why you think central planning uh, is effective. Or MSNBC or the, CNN. None of them I'm can not admit MSNBC there were or CNN. <laughs> with their socialist economy until roughly about 2014. Why am I getting yeah, let, real? Let's let's so part, let's let's, let's not obscures extensively obscures. Why are you saying this and none of them are saying? This? I don't I don't I don't, I don't think Destiny wants to uh, I don't think Destiny wants to speak for media companies. Um yeah, I'm not here to well, I, I appreciate to, you your know? honesty because sure. everyone the tells me all the time everyone's been starving ever since they they moved towards socialism in Venezuela. You admit that the problems began fairly recently. Thank sure. you. I'm, yeah, the the Thank you for your honesty. So we can agree anti-communists are liars. We can agree on that. That the anti-communist narrative that's promoted throughout U.S. society is based on deception and falsehood. Thank you for admitting that. I appreciate I, it. I don't know if Destiny can 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 so I haven't make that claim. Anything. Why, and why sure. is it necessary to lie, Destiny? Why don't they say what you just said? Why don't why I don't I don't I, be, I don't think they say Destiny that. can't Destiny can't speak for media companies. Well, Destiny, well, go I, ahead and I, respond. I, because all the people that were alive in the United States probably either have parents or grandparents that were involved in some crazy dumbass U.S. war against <laughs> communists. I mean, the idea that like all commies are trying to destroy the world and commie blah, 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 blah. And like that, that is a lie. And it's stupid. It's incredibly stupid. The way that Americans view, if you ask the average American, what is socialism? The answer they would probably give you is stealing money from the rich and giving it to the poor. OK, I'm not here to defend the average American sentiments for so socialism or communism. That's absurd. However, your counterpoints are just as propaganda laden to try to say that industrialization in the Soviet Union was successful, um, even though these were done on the backs of massive famines that were a great show case of the failures in central planning as a as a support for central planning is famines just never happen under capitalism people never starve under i mean this is this is obscure and and then you take a couple isolated famines and make them the characterization what? of an entire country industrializing and becoming a superpower 
This is, what, this is what, ridiculous. How? That would be like me saying that, uh, that, you know, the mass deaths in the U.S. Civil War proved that American capitalism doesn't work. That would be like me saying the Great Depression proves that capitalism doesn't work. I mean, that's 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 ridiculous. You right? could a whole the country great. becomes no. a global superpower, that's becomes totally a global superpower, invents space travel, electrifies the entire place, is building some of the biggest hydroelectrical power plants in the world. People that lived in huts are suddenly living in modern apartment buildings with electricity. But none of that counts because there was a famine along the way. That I'm is, not that saying is absurd. I'm the not saying miracles took place. The whole world was trying to be like the Soviet Union at that point. The you only know? miracle I mean, is that there are New still York Ukrainians and Kazakhs alive crazy. today to talk about how horrible central planning under what? the Soviet Union was. Oh, look, I mean, like that's a miracle that like some no, people I, actually survived some of those no, famines. They were being I, executed. They tried to leave their starving district after the Soviet Okay, okay. I don't. Eastern Europe. I don't want to. Every former socialist country of Eastern Europe polls overwhelmingly show people saying life was better. That's so not when they from Russia. Yeah, when Soviet have, nostalgia is at an all-time high. The I don't. Live I don't. I don't want us to talk over top each other. So, Destiny, go ahead. I'm going to give Destiny the floor for a minute. So it's nostalgia under the old American system. People nostalgia. Um, uh, they people lived under it. They know how horrible it is, Destiny. <laughs> okay. You, okay. Let's rain. Let's rain this back. So let's rain this back. Destiny, go ahead. Go I ahead. don't see any Nazi nostalgia in Germany. I'll tell you that much. Really. I don't think around the world today. You don't think that there are groups like the AFD in Germany that's like doubled its popular I support. I don't. I don't. I, right. I don't see that's Germans go, that's talking different. about how great how great the, the Nazi system was. I, I really don't. So, you know, the fact that that Soviet nostalgia is so high, not just in Russia, but in you know all kinds of places, even like places like Romania that had big difficulties. People are nostalgic for the system of socialism that is existed. Sure. Well, sure. People can be nostalgic for older systems for a but couple. They, but they're what? supposed to, if it's a hell on earth, you're, they're, they, they lived under it. They well, it's not hell on earth for a lot of people. Thankfully, a lot of the people that had hell on earth fucking died. So they're not here to talk about how horrible the systems were because they died with like the parts of their children in their stomach after they ate them because they starved to death. So we don't have a lot of those people talking anymore about but it. That never happens under capitalism, right? I mean, there wasn't what? huge okay. famines in what? India what? caused by the British what? Empire. There wasn't what? huge famines so... in Ireland caused by British capitalism. I mean, you know, you know, you know, but, but like this I is still... the difference. Okay. There, the, were, this, there were annual deaths of starvation in Russia all the time before the revolution. There were annual deaths of starvation in China are, all the time. But none of that is because of the old system. Are, are, okay, okay, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. They've actually gotten them out of the system. Okay, okay, okay. Destiny, Destiny, why? Caleb, Caleb, Destiny, why is he arguing your point for you? Because saying that, like, well, there were massive famines in, in the Soviet Union, which a lot of them weren't as bad as the ones that happened in Ukraine and Kazakhstan, saying that there were famines before central planning, and then saying they were there after central planning, that's my oh, argument. Yeah, central planning. Uh, actually, so I don't know. How to it was central planning that mechanized agriculture. They no, got them out of all, those situations. That, it was central planning that, that Union, actually cured, Soviet cured these Union problems. It was central tractors. planning that made China, instead of being a sick man of Asia that has mass impoverishment and mass famines all the time, into being the second largest economy in the world. You're blaming the system that, that cures famines and cures these problems, even though it takes a while to do it, perhaps. You know, they are the ones that actually are responsible for the industrialization. You're blaming them for something that happened under your system all the time. I'm not. When the British okay. controlled China. There were famines all the time. Okay. And, and with okay, communists this... in power in China, they have become the second largest economy on earth. They, they have wiped out poverty. The IMF and the World Bank is praising everything that they have done. But you blame them. For what? I mean, this is this is ridiculous. This is a ridiculous double standard. Okay. Okay. Go so, ahead, wait, firstly, it's not you can't pivot to saying what about capitalism every time I bring up an issue with your system. This isn't strengthening your arguments. It is a hardcore non sequitur. It feels like when I argue with with conservatives and I say, hey, Donald Trump's foreign policy is absolutely fucking horrible, and then somebody says, well, what about Obama's foreign policy? Yeah, that was horrible, too. What do you expect me to say? Do you sit here and expect me to defend when people starve to death or can't find houses in a capitalist system? These are massive failures within my system. The difference is, is that, one, I'm not married to capitalism as, as, as some, like, emotional point that it's, like, part of my personality. Like, I need – I don't give a fuck about capitalism. If there are better economic systems that work, then move us there. I am all for that. So in your four-point plan, of which we're only a point two of, when you talk about things like rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure, pouring money into public projects like that is great. 
It gives people jobs. It makes our public utilities more accessible. Hopefully it makes it so things like Flint, Michigan don't happen again, which are horrible. A country of this much wealth should not be pumping lead into fucking children. That is absolutely fucked up. So if you're going to sit here and say, well, there are failures of capitalism. Yeah, of course I'm going to agree with you. I'd be an idiot not to. I lived under a lot of those failures. But it's not fair when I say, hey, your system failed to address this or failed to do this for you to point and go, well, these are still some problems under capitalism. Sure, but we're not having everybody in the state of Arkansas or Texas die because of some famine and then killing people when they try to escape the country somebody finds out about it right these are one there's a difference in scale and two i'm not claiming that capitalism on its own in the purest most libertarian pipe dream system will fix all of these problems capitalism needs to be heavily regulated the profit interest doesn't always work in the public favor favor but I don't think you can just say, well, because there are problems with capitalism, let's try central planning when central planning has not effectively worked for any economy ever. You even brought up India earlier as an example that failed for a long time under central planning and only started to boom and develop when economic liberalization started to take place there. So it's not fair for you to say like, oh, well, you know, central planning can work because there are problems in capitalism. That's not an argument. Well, that's not my argument. My argument is economic miracles happen because of central planning and you don't credit them because there were hardships also. That's my argument. In 2004, the head of the World Bank, Robert Zolik, said, quote, between 1981 and 2004, China succeeded in lifting more than half a billion people out of extreme poverty. This is certainly the greatest leap to overcome poverty in history. But it doesn't count because there was a famine, according to you, right? That doesn't matter. 800 million people lifted out of poverty. Well, there was a famine in the 60s, so therefore it doesn't count. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Your, your, your argument is you are taking problems in socialism and painting them as if they are the entire socialist experience. And I'm saying socialism has resulted in huge successes and there have been successes of central planning. And you are obscuring that and denying that. And I'm po and then you're pointing to the problems in socialism and I'm pointing out that these very problems you list are probably more prevalent under capitalism. That's what I'm saying. Um, and and that's- <laughs> So I think I'm kind of curious. Point, so the first huge- Central sure. planning didn't improve things. And I'm pointing out, yes, it did. And the things that you're faulting central planning for happen far more frequently under capitalism. Do you think that China would have succeeded as the way that it did today? You mentioned that from 1981 to 2004, that was when they had their big economic boom. Do you think that it's a coincidence that in 1979, that's when the US and China established normal trade relations? Do you think that China was able to grow in large part due to the horrible capitalism of the United States and the fact that we have such a massive trade deficit that has grown and grown and grown over time, that we power a lot of that economy, both with the foreign investments they make in our currency and our property over here in the form of capital and in the form of the goods that we import from that country? You don't think any of that has helped China at all? Or you think it was all just the magic of socialism i think it was absolutely necessary to introduce the market reforms absolutely and that when deng xiaoping you know established trade relations with the united states that was a very good thing and i think it's also false to characterize china as a capitalist country when they got... well, i didn't characterize them as a capitalist country. i know but 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 you know, that's a common argument that's made. Wait, um, why are you talking about common arguments that's made? I don't care about the note cards. Yeah, let's, let's, let's like the Fox News talking. Let's, let's, let's right stay here in a, in a bar, Destiny. The, the whole world's watching this. Let's, I am saying things that no one ever gets to hear because the media is owned by big banks and big corporations that don't want people to know the facts. Let's only stay I'm on what Destiny needs to be said and that. China's success, their system of socialism with Chinese characteristics, where the, despite the fact you have foreign investment, despite the fact that you have a lot of private corporations, the state still plans out production, uh, that they adjusted it in a way that was very effective. Right? Caleb, in let's... the 1970s, they were having big problems. Uh, the Gang of Four, uh, the way they were, were ruling the country and the way they were holding back economic development was a big, big problem. And the Soviet Union was unable to adjust. That's why, despite the fact that they had huge amounts of tremendous economic growth and, and really achieved real big miracles in the 80s, they needed to adjust. And rather than adjusting, the result of perestroika and glasnost was, was a collapse. They were like, they, they were not able to bend, so they broke. But okay. the notion that, that capitalism okay. is somehow responsible for China's growth, well, you could argue that they've traded with capitalist countries. but. But they've pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. I think China's achievements are an inspiration to the entire world. Uh, what they I'm kind of curious. Caleb, Caleb, uh, Caleb, 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 Caleb. Let's 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 only let's only address points that Wait, that people sure. are making so and I'm, not and not like a hypothetical. So, Destiny, sure, so go I'm, ahead. I'm very curious. So, like, because we talk about how like 
people are dying under capitalism due to hunger and whatnot, right? So we have had millions, tens of millions of people die in the USSR due to famines. Um, millions of people died under Maoism. Has this happened under capitalist countries like that are major superpowers that aren't like these very tiny, very small, you know, African countries has like the United States or Great Britain experienced like these same types of like mass famines or mass starvations as like some of these like socialist countries? May I speak? Go for it. Prior to 1917, prior to 1949, China was one of those poor countries. <laughs> You're missing the point. The global capitalist system keeps these countries in those situations. That's the point, right? Okay. You're missing the point entirely. A major country. You, these countries are not major countries because of capitalism. You're missing the point entirely, right? You're missing the point entirely. Okay, Destiny, if you'd like to, I'd, I'd like us to move on to point three, and, and let's stay point by point and not go off on tangents. So, Des Caleb, if you'd like to state point three, and then we can, we can Destiny can respond. I didn't plan this out for this to be me going over some four proposals I have. I think we're having a great debate here, and we're getting the essence of what we need to talk about. So, I have no desire, if you want to keep go going over the merits of four points I recommended, please do, but I, that's, I have no commitment to this style of debate. I'm, I'm oh. happy with what we're doing. Well, I just um, want to, it's very rare that like people that advocate for socialism like actually give me policy points. I'm actually thrilled that you did that. I really appreciate that because most okay. of them just appeal to some vague utopian notion of everybody gets everything for free and doesn't work. So I like policy points. I love to talk good. policy because we can actually look at empirical studies and everything. Well, um, I think that's, so, that's good and I, I agree with you. That is one of my critiques of a lot on the left is I think every socialist should be able to answer the question, what would you do if you were the president? What would you do if you were the president? They should have a real answer and that answer shouldn't be, oh, I don't want to be the president. I have a violent revolution. Revolution, right? Violent revolutions are pretty ugly events in which lots of people die and they're pretty horrendous, right? I think that, that people should want socialism because they want to make the country a better place. Um, I don't think they should want socialism because they want to get out their adolescent anger or get some cathartic revenge or something like that. And I think it's, it's problematic that for a lot of young people, their attraction to socialism is almost an expression of their alienation. I think that could change if there were some kind of mass socialist or communist movement in the United States. I think it would attract people uh, and people would functioning in it would operate in a bit of a different manner. But I think that's a problem that the left faces, especially in the Western world at this time. There's a, a, a level of alienation and, you know, it attracts people that, 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 that don't have a constructive mindset. That's why, you know, this, this book that I just published, City Builders and Vandals in Our Age, is about, you know, my critique of the left in, in some ways and my history. I link socialism. I go back to Julius Caesar. I go back to, to you know, I, I think socialism is the modern incarnation of what you could call the city building tendency throughout human history in which there has been a progressive side of human beings who want to advance and get to a higher stage. Um, and I think socialism it was really an expression of people trying to, to get to something better and build a better world in advance. And it's, it's human progress that defines Marxism and the Marxist ideology. So I agree with you there. Okay. Um, yeah. I, okay. Um, so for the third point, for the banking thing, um, I, when, you, when you say that banking needs to be in the hands of the state, are you saying that like all banks, all credit cards, all lenders, that this is stuff that should be handled by like the federal government or state governments? Like, if it was up to me, yeah, I think banking should be a government operation. So this includes like like all forms of lending, so things like credit cards and and, and everything yeah. as well, right? That's in my view, yes. <laughs> so when it comes to like setting like interest rates and whatnot for banks, is this stuff that like people would vote on, or would you hire like technocrats to to figure this stuff out as well? Or I'm just curious. I think obviously the government would have to appoint people that that knew what they were doing there. I don't think average people should be voting on interest rates. Okay, gotcha. Um, okay, I don't think that's too controversial. I think there are some states that have uh, countries that have like banks where the banking well, is. Alexander converted. Hamilton advocated a national bank for the United States. It's not really a new concept. Many sure. countries have it. Okay, and then what on the on the economic bill of rights? Um, what do you mean when you refer to this? Well, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, before he died, in one of his final State of the Union addresses, he advocated mm -hmm. that we provide housing for people, that we provide a job to people provide people with education. Um, and I think that's a great idea. I think people should have these things. Um, social democratic countries have them. European welfare states have them. There's no reason we shouldn't provide our citizens with, with health care. There's no reason we shouldn't provide people with education. Um, I think, you know, I, I tell people I'm a socialist because I believe in hard work, right? That I think that every person should be viewed as an asset to the country. 
right? I think that every person's talent and skill should be unleashed. And I know right now, one of the greatest tragedies of capitalism, is there's so many young people who are full of creativity and potential, but yet because of capitalism, they're stuck, you know, sweeping floors at McDonald's or, or doing some job that is not rewarding to them. And, and I think the job of a socialist government would be to find the skills of Americans and unleash them to build a better country overall. And that would require not allowing people's lives to just simply be left up to whatever is profitable for a corporation. I think state central planning, uh, you know, is, is a good thing. And it could result in strategically building up the country and building a better life. And right now the country is suffering from deindustrialization. I would say the same thing that Wall Street and, and London have done to places like Africa and South America. They're now doing to places like Pennsylvania and Ohio and, and Wisconsin, right? That the country is being looted by big international corporations that have no loyalty to anything but their own profits. And in my YouTube lives that I do every week, one of the slogans that I've tried to popularize is, we need a government of action to fight for working families. We need a government of action to fight for working families. This notion that the government is best that governs least, you know, just let the economy take care of itself, that has gotten us into a rut in this country. Statecraft, the notion that the government has an obligation to serve the people, I think that needs to be revived. How's that? Um, yeah, I don't disagree with any of that. The government that governs least is the best is, is a, a really, really stupid slogan. It sounds like something a laissez fair uh, liberal would say or something. Um, I, so backing up to the first part of this, every person's talent should be unleashed. So um, obviously it's not a policy. It's it's, it's a, an aspiration, right? Sure. I, to put that in so, the like, wall. in your ideal economy, how do you like, um, how do you dish out like jobs to people? How how do we decide like who fills what jobs? I guess like the most like vulgar way is like who who are this country's garbage men? Like, how how do you deal with this type of work? Well, I I would assume that the public sector would have ways of when they have an opening, people would apply for the job, and whoever's running that department in the public sector would hire them, and the private sector would continue to hire based on what they felt was best, and yeah. Well, but like in, in a socialist system where we're trying to unleash everybody's talent and they don't have to work like bad jobs, like well, how, how do you fill out these types of positions? What if you get like 75% of the population wants to be teachers or something or nobody wants to apply for some of these jobs? Sure. Nobody wants to work at McDonald's or Burger right. King. Well, the Works Progress Administration in which Roosevelt hired millions of unemployed people and put them to work building things like Key West Highway or, or uh, the airport, uh, LaGuardia Airport here in New York City or post offices is a great example of you have lots of unemployed people. So you hire them to do things that benefit the country overall, like pave the roads, like uh, like like build things. Right. Um, that, know, those that programs that's, that's, only that's work. Vision, and, and I think yeah, but the government. Should but, should step in and mobilize the public uh, to rebuild the country's infrastructure. I'm for yeah, that. But those programs only work under the threat of capitalism because if you don't get that job or you don't do that that policy that the government is like uh, implementing for for those jobs things, you'll starve or you won't have a house, right? Those only work under the under that kind of like implied violence. In your state, would well, it still be the same? I guess or. Well, I, I think that people, I, I think we shouldn't need a welfare state because people should have universal employment. That's kind of my thinking, right, is that we shouldn't have to give money to people that don't have a job because everyone should have a job. And then you think that like, so right now, generally, if there's a demand for a job, we pay more for it. If there's too much, too many people working for a job, we don't pay as much for it. Um, I, right. do, do you just have like an organization that sets like this is how many of these jobs we need and you hope sure. that people apply for it and if we need more government garbage men and people aren't applying for the job they'll have to incentivize more pay for people to become garbage men i i don't i don't have a problem with that you know okay how is this that you're describing capitalism if you have a higher demand for like a certain type directed of directed by the state uh with the state making a determination about what we need the state says, oh, we need to go repave the roads. They hire people to go and repave the roads. They don't just say, oh, let's hope a corporation does it and make profits from it. Well, but what you're describing is like less efficient capitalism, right? So like a market would say, we need this job filled. It's not getting filled. So we increase the wages paid for this job to get somebody else to work it. If you're saying, well, we could just have a government decide to do this, it's literally doing capitalism, but less efficiently. Well, actually, no, the market's not saying that. Right now in the USA, we have a free market economy and our roads are crumbling and our water's not being properly purified and we, our electrical power plants are, are in shambles and capitalists continue to make more and more profits. Um, we don't, you know, I think that's that's the opposite. We need a public transportation system in this country that's efficient. We ought to have high-speed trains connecting this country. But the free market doesn't want to do that. Well, I think 
a central planner needs to step in and say, yes, we do need that. It would be good for the country overall. May not be in the interests of, of Rockefeller and Carnegie and DuPont, but it's the, in the interests of the population overall. Why don't we have high speed trains here? China is at this point. Because the infrastructure isn't train something in the entire yet. world, right? Th this China's is state controlled corporations are building the fastest trains in the entire world. I mean, unbelievable. But socialism can't invent anything, socialism never does anything, right? <laughs> That's not what you're saying, I know. Sure. I, that answer had nothing to do with my question. Um, I, like, obviously, there are infrastructure problems. Um, there isn't a lot of profit to be made in, in these types of sectors. So the government would have to plan for these things, right? Much the same way that. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's that's yeah, my point. We need the government to step <laughs> um, in and do what the market will not do. Sure, which which is like dealing with industries where there aren't strong profit incentives or where the incentives might lead to strange moral hazards or other types of tomfoolery that aren't good. <clears throat> so, for instance, like in healthcare, it's probably not good to leave this up to the free markets because it seems like there's a lot of bad incentives here that ruin that system. But that's a far cry from planning everything, like all the jobs in society. Yeah, and we, we can't plan everything. I agree with you. Again, I don't think hotels should be run by the government. Tech companies should be private. People want to invent a new app or something. Why should the government be in on that? You need people that are creative and want to make some money to do that kind of thing. No disagreement there. And I think that, you know, the reason that everything was ultimately nationalized in the Soviet Union was because it was such an impoverished country. And then after the Russian Revolution, 15 countries invaded and wrecked the place. And, you know, so the government stepped in and mobilized the population to build it all. But they, Wait, needed, it. they needed to transition toward a market system, in my view. I wasn't I'm, I'm so but, like. I, I, I'm so confused about what you're actually arguing for because it feels like at some points we're jumping to very strong arguments in support of central planning and then at other points we're literally arguing neoliberalism. We're like, oh yeah, like tech companies and all of these things, private incentives are very good there. We should have capital investment. That's the good, but we just need to deal with- The control the lending of money. The state should control the major industries like steel manufacturing, like oil, like, you know, oil is a natural resource, or but you know, it should- Wait, so how, how that's, so like, let's say- the Let's auto companies, we've bailed them out how many times, right? The three major auto companies. Why why aren't they under public ownership? We had because they paid back the loan because they, they paid the back the loans they were given. Wait, because they paid back those loans. They weren't just given a free handout. That was money that they paid back with interest to the federal government. And it protected a lot of American jobs when major they did it. Major industries should be under public ownership, I think. Wait, you know, does that include um, like tech industries like Facebook or ownership. what? Does that include like like tech companies and like Facebook or major companies like hotel That's owners? Like that's, that's an interesting question. I haven't thought about that. But, you know, if you think about it, though, Facebook is kind of a monopoly. And there's some people that argue that Facebook should be considered a utility rather than considered to be a private company because it is a virtual monopoly. And let's let's remember, Silicon Valley was created basically because, you know, the, the U.S. government made a strategic decision. I mean, loaning from the CIA, from the NSA. You know, I mean, the, the tech revolution was a result of government intervention largely uh, because we saw it as a strategic way to defeat the Soviet Union. When Al Gore there's said, a big, there's a far cry yeah. from the very basic like inventions or innovations or discoveries that the public sector makes versus the private sector taking those things and doing the necessary work to bring it to market, right? Yeah, we don't I, have I, IMAX, that, that we, we, we don't have like, we don't, uh, social media, I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. I think a strong argument could be made in favor sure, of that. Sure, I'm just, I'm trying to figure out because I'm, I'm like, I don't know, like I, because in some ways, you literally sound like a sock dem. You sound like a social democrat, or maybe even a neoliberal. And then in other ways, you sound like a full-on well, social, like, social planet. Democrats tend to believe the economy should function according to profits, but we should give people stuff at the same time. We should have social welfare programs. I'm saying we need central planning with a market sector. Okay, I have a question. I have a question from chat because I'm I'm a bit mm -hmm. confused on that too because it does sound like you're arguing for social democracy. But so there's a question from chat. It said, so in these industries that you say could be private, say a hotel. Would you give the ownership to the workers in that situation, or would you allow a private capitalist to own the, the hotel himself? Personally, I think that it would be better if it was a cooperative of the workers, because it would be run better, because every worker would get a share of the profits, and um, as a result, they would be motivated to do the best job they possibly could. They wouldn't just be getting a wage, but the more their profits increased, the more the wages of the average person <laughs> went. So if it was up to me, if I were the magical dictator Wait. of this hypothetical country, I would say, yes, every worker has a share and it is a worker cooperative. Okay, wait, can I can I make a, can I take, can I make a rule for this conversation? And then you, Faraday, you figure out if you want to yep. put it on it's, You can't weasel out of giving an answer to say, well, personally, I would say this, right? Everything you say is personally. We're trying to figure out like, what do you think is like the ideal form of government or economic system to, to run a country, not into every nitty gritty specific, but like, it's very weasely to say like, oh, well, personally, I would like this to happen. Cause it's like, well, what does that mean? Do you think it should happen or that the government should do it? Or that's just like you're randomly giving us like your random opinion that's not relevant. Like, I don't, I don't understand that, that retreat to like, well, personally, I think this should happen. I don't think it's a because fair way to answer the question. there's a strong difference between Marxism yeah. and utopianism. 
right? If you read, there's a very good pamphlet by Frederick Engels, right? Uh, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. And that, that was, you know, prior to Marxism, that was the big idea, right? People would go out into the middle of the woods in, you know, in Indiana and build their ideal socialist society or, you know, utopianism is a different trend. Marxism recognizes that socialism comes into being as a result of contradictions in society and millions of being people being pushed into motion. It doesn't come into existence because somebody draws up a really nice blueprint. And I think that's what I'm trying to stay away from. I think so, that's that's the, the fundamental difference here. And that, that Marxism is not a utopian doctrine. Uh, Marxism is a scientific understanding of how society mm -hmm. works. Okay, you but know? like you can't say that like when I ask like, well, how does this work and go, well, a lot of people have a different idea of how it should work. Like, that's not like an answer to the question. Yeah, I yeah, I, I, I would have to agree with Destiny in I'm this making one. Making it difficult for us to argue, I know. I, I can see that, and I, I understand your frustration. But I'm just telling you, you know, I think that society should be controlled by the people, and the major centers of economic power should be controlled by the state. But when it comes to individual nitty-gritty, I almost, I'm not concerned about it. I, I, you know, it's like I can have to tell you what my personal opinion is, but that's not really relevant in the debate of capitalism versus yeah, but the, socialism. The, pr the problem is you end up hijacking a lot of my talking points. And now I, I like in some places, I find that I'm almost arguing against like my own social democratic point of view. So when you say like society should be controlled by the people, it already is. We live in a democratic republic. We vote on people that vote on policies on, on our behalf, and that's how our society works. So, I mean, obviously, as somebody that lives in a democratic republic, I agree with that. Then when you say, well, large companies should be controlled by the state, I, I still have no idea, and Faraday, if I'm being unfair, you mm -hmm. can step in and say, well, he did explain this. I have no idea what your metric or rubric is for deciding what to nationalize or what not to nationalize. Now, to be fair, I'll, so because it feels like every time I ask this, every socialist says, well, that's not fair. I don't know the nitty gritty. So the way that I would answer this question is- But I every say, socialist sounds like me too? I, I'm curious. I, well, yeah, they always, re they always retreat uh, back to these vague things. Well, people disagree on things. Well, I don't know the nitty gritty. These are absurd hypotheticals. So if somebody would ask me, well, okay, destiny, well, how do you think some things should be nationalized or some things not? Because you think public utilities are good, don't you? Then I would say, yeah, there are some things that need to be state owned. When there are externalities or market failures that make it impossible for a profit motive to align with public interest, then that is something that probably should be nationalized. So for instance, in the case of utilities, there is a massive upfront investment required to run utilities to every single individual house. It's not realistic to expect that companies could compete here. That would be a market failure, right? This high barrier to entry. So you socialize it. Or if we look at something like healthcare, where there might be a ton of profit incentives involved in obfuscating your ability to receive healthcare in the way that you consume it, prices are wildly distorted, right? If we have people dying because of a profit motive attached to healthcare, well, that's not good. That's not something we want. So our profit motive doesn't align there. So in cases like these, where there are market failures that make it so that the motivation, the profit motive, whether it's healthcare pollution or whatever, don't align with what we consider to be the public interest, those are the things where the government steps in and regulate it. That would be my answer to questions like these. So when I ask you- So we agree. Oh, cool. Then you're a sock dem. Then we don't disagree on anything. <laughs> That's my confusion, too. It does seem like you're... Nationalized. Caleb, it does right? seem... Because, because every socialist like co-ops like my talking points. Because you, you just did it earlier. You're like, well, hotels, those should be privately ranked. Americans That's... would agree with this. Honestly, it's okay. only because of a lot of distortion and propaganda and, and, and dismissal of the realities of what happened in the 20th century that people don't agree with this. Right, but most social democrats don't af advocate nationalizations. So what you just said there about I don't hear Bernie Sanders ever get up and say that we should nationalize things. I like he's Bernie Sanders. He's talking about nationalizing ways, health care. He just what talks about mean? giving people free college and health care. He doesn't talk about nationalizing things like you just did. I think that's he's the wait. B firstly, so, so so social democrats are generally opposed to nationalizing things. They believe in capitalism, right? That's like a defining feature of a social democrat. Firstly, nowadays, yes. Sure, nowadays, yes. Okay, maybe not in the twenties or whatever. Like, but nowadays that right. is like a defining feature of a social. Democrat. Secondly, Bernie has talked about nationalizing. Bernie's talked about nationalizing health care. Um, Good. <clears throat> okay. I, I thought he was for single payer, where it's like the state insurance company, but the hospitals are still private. Oh, I don't, I don't know if he's talking about privatizing. Yeah, all I think he, he advocates me. a state insurance plan, but but then it pays private companies. That's, sure, okay. That's so he's talked about nationalizing like all of the insurance stuff, but not maybe not necessarily the hospitals. I'm not 100% on that, right. but sure. Okay. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's that's the difference. Um, but yeah, where do you want to go next? I'm having a great time. So it seems like your definition, it, it is very similar to social democracy. It's just that for you, you would you you would nationalize more industri industries where you think countries like Norway don't. But don't they don't they nationalize a lot of industries in these countries as well? Um, if you look at Norway, you look at Sweden, 
overall, the economy functions on the basis of profits. There's a lot of progressive taxation. There's a lot of social programs that are, are administered to people. Good thing, not opposed to that, but it's still a capitalist market economy. I think that's the difference. Uh, the, the major centers of economic power, despite a few nationalizations, still function on the basis of what's profitable. That's the difference. Okay, I, wait, okay I'm so confused. Yeah, Dustin, help me wait, work this one out because I'm confused wait, as well. Wait, wait, no, no, wait. Yeah, because you're talking about like, well, hotels should exist privately, but they should be co-ops. This is a form of market socialism. So it's like a market economy, yes. like, yes. so is a market economy market good socialism, or? Market socialism is still socialism, yes. Okay, so you're in favor of like market-based systems, but then this seems to run contrary to a lot of the central plan you want to do. Or you want to centrally plan some industries have like a mixed economy, I guess. Subordinated by the state. If there's state central planning, if production's not being carried out simply according to profits, you know, one thing about the market sector in China, for example, is that these private companies are also controlled by the government. At any point, the government can show up and say, yeah, we want you to produce this instead of this. And they can't go, well, this is my private company. You know, even private companies are subject to state overall dictates and central planning. I think that's obscured, too. Right. Uh, you, you know, in, in in this kind of society that that I guess since we're doing this, but that I envision. Right. We would have private companies, but at any point, uh, you know, the state could show up and say, okay, private company, your job is to do what the state central plan says to do, you know? So is, the, dif that is the difference in your system who has more influence over the government, like in terms of like capitalists would have less influence? The difference is, the difference is that in a capitalist economy, did you see that Trump just said, now here's a great example. Trump said on Twitter, he said, I hereby order our great American companies to stop doing business with China or to start thinking about stopping or whatever. He can't do that because they're private companies. They have, they, they have the right to do it. I envision a society in which we had a government of action that would fight for working families that would be able to go to the companies and say, I hereby order you to do this. It's in the interest of public overall where the right of private property on the part of business owners wouldn't trump the right of a good society and making sure people have what they need on the part of the population overall. Wait, so what would, so you, I'm sorry, I kind of missed, so like, do you think that Trump should be able to tell people not to sell to certain countries or? In a hypothetical socialist society, yes. Okay. Yes, I mean, and the reason that his command on Twitter was meaningless the reason it was meaningless is because we don't have socialism here. In China, if President Xi said, I hereby order this private company to do something, they would have to do it. Here, no. Okay. Um, is there, or, I don't know if you had more questions for a day or anything. Right? I, I, I don't have any more questions. Is there anywhere else you want to take the conversation, either one of you? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I like my modern day China. Um, I've been watching a lot of stuff um, recently, like on the sure. Uyghurs, um, is pretty scary. Um, or the amount of like media suppression that goes on there, you know, the great firewall of China and all of that, um, is pretty spooky. But I mean, I'm, I'm guessing, or I would hope that you probably don't defend these types of policies. And I, I I'm not China's lawyer. So <laughs> I, you know, I, I know everyone I've ever talked to from there says there are big concerns about human rights. So, you know, I, again, I'm not interested in defending human rights violations. I will say that the economic miracle that's happened there is a result of socialism and it's a result of central planning and that, you know, there's all this talk about Hong Kong right now. Let's talk about why was Hong Kong seized from China to begin with? Because of the opium wars, right? When China tried to tell the British Empire they didn't want opium to pour into their country, they tried to take control of their economy and the British declared war on them and forced them to be part of this free market capitalist global economy. Now, some sources are now saying that up to 100 million people died. 100 million people died as a result of those opium wars, of the forced importation of narcotics, of keeping China a, a colony that wasn't able to, to industrialize and have its own industries. Um, and, and, you know, I, that's capitalism. That's the global free market system. That's Adam Smith, right? That's the invisible hand working its way. But China, having broken out of that system, seized control of its economy, has been able to come out of those kind of nightmares. Hold on, I can't, this, I, I can't, that, like, that's imperialism. I don't think that's necessarily capitalism. Imperialism is capitalism in its monopoly stage. That's the okay, that's fine. Entire book that's, about. that's great. Then the, Uyghurs, then the Uyghurs being massively the deported world. from their home. Sure. Then the Uyghurs. Sits sure. At the center, then the than Uyghurs, sure. Capital. Then the Uyghurs being massively deported from their homes and 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 having their children stolen from them and then being like sent off into random camps or whatever. Um, that's like the end goal of like the the like the extreme like socialist world where you have to re-educate your people, where you murder farm people, where you plan famines in the Soviet Union to kill some I, people. I don't like, even 
I, I don't think that even the staunchest defender of the Chinese government would say that the way they are now is the end goal, right? Socialism That's is a great tool. Socialism is so a tool. So is capitalism. You can have, are you trying to right. tell me that you can't capitalism have Capitalism was a great advance sure. over are, feudalism. Sure. And feudalism was a great advance over sure. slavery. Are you trying and to tell I me think like, socialism would be a great advance over capitalism and it would get us toward the ultimate vision of a world you, with so much technology and so much abundance we could get rid of, you know, we could get rid of any need for coercion. It's the ultimate vision, maybe thousands of years in the future. That's from each according to his own ability to each according his, to his need is the ultimate vision. But but socialism is a method. It's a method that countries in the impoverished world have utilized to raise their people up out of poverty, to industrialize. And they've had quite a few successes. Sure. And has have cap has have as have as being. The, the entire experience. Sure, and as have capitalist nations as well, if we want to attribute all of it to the economic systems. Capital, would you agree with that, that capitalism has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty if socialism has? No, I wouldn't. I would say capitalism <sighs> is keeping people in poverty. And I Wait, would you don't, say that- You don't think capitalism has led to the advancement of like technology and, and, and sure, people's living conditions yeah. and- it's like this is like the reverse Republican meme where like instead of every bad thing being blamed, Republicans do a lot of dumb shit where they blame every bad thing that's ever happened on socialism, which is absurd. But now we're doing this thing where we blame every good thing that like during the massive period of industrialization on this planet in some of these countries with the largest populations on Earth, we attribute those industrialized industrialized countries to socialism, but we don't get to yeah. claim anything under capitalism. But capitalism is still no. at fault when some people no, start I, I, capitalism. I give like capitalism credit, and if you read the Communist Manifesto, Marx spends pages and pages giving them credit for the advance over feudalism. Wait, then why did you disagree? Costs. It came at heavy costs, though. The so, did the, so did socialism. Trade, so did the USSR. Trade, Slavery didn't just happen under capitalism. Stalin made homosexuality illegal costs. again. Stalin wanted to kill the Jews as well. The USSR no, killed billions yes, of land. Capitalism was an advance over what was there before, and no one denies that. And the Marxist understanding of world history is that it is like a train speeding forward. But we've gotten to the point where capitalism is no longer a, a viable answer. It's making things worse. It's holding back human progress. But yes, <laughs> capitalism was definitely an advance over what was there before, but don't say it didn't come without cost. I mean, the, the breaking up of the feudal commons in Britain, for example, right, in order to, to take all these people off the feudal estates and commons uh, involved the killing of, of thousands and thousands of people. King Henry VIII, you know, I ended up hanging people for the crime of being homeless, for vagrancy. They were hanging vagabonds, the genocide in the Scottish Highlands, right? Uh, I mean, I mean, capitalism's creation involved mass theft, right? They always say socialism is theft. Well, it involved mass theft and it involved mass killing in order to create capitalism and, and to, to break well, apart the system and create the capitalist this? system. I never said there wasn't a cost to capitalism, but you must, like, you're literally saying capitalism involved mass theft, and then in the breath earlier, you were saying that we need to expropriate forcefully a lot of industries in the United States. That's mass theft as well. Uh, So, I mean, like, socialism in in all of its forms today has... That that notion that, uh, that, that, that socialism is theft and capitalists all just earned it you know, your friend Joe the bar owner or, or Bob the pizza shop owner, yeah, he earned it by the sweat of his brow. I don't have a problem with him. I have a problem with, with the billionaire bankers that run the world and run it through a, 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 a system in which they profit from keeping the world poor. Right? Billion- I mean, so, firstly, I don't even know what's happening. They're trying to keep the world poor so that they can stay rich. That doesn't and even make sense. With from okay, okay. De- you don't okay. Let, 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 let Destiny. Let, let Destiny go now. Destiny, go ahead. It doesn't even make sense. You don't want a poor world, right? Like, people are trying to make the, the rest of the world, like, wealthier because you want more people to sell goods to. Like, that's, like, a super basic tenet of capitalism. It's why capitalism has become so woke recently in the United States with uh, with people selling, like, gay advertisements for Gillette razors or for people selling movies with black people. Capitalists want as many people included in their shit as possible so that they can sell the maximum amount of goods and make as much money, you know, irrespective of, of anything else. This idea that, like, it demands that certain people be kept out is not true. Now, does it happen under capitalist systems? Yeah, of course. The same way that it can happen under any economic system, because any economic system is going to necessarily be reflective of the underlying values of those people. You are never going to take a country full of people that hate Jews and black people and give them socialism, and now all of a sudden they're like, oh man, I love black people and Jews because they're our workers now. That never happens. It hasn't happened. It won't ever happen. Much the same way that a capitalist society full of people that hate black people are probably going to be pro-slavery or are probably going to be uh, against you know selling goods or services to black people in certain towns. Like I don't think that solving these types of social issues is reflective of any kind of economic system that's insane i i i i don't know what you're getting at there at the end um but i will say that yes the way 
the Western capitalist system keeps its power is by keeping countries as impoverished captive markets. Uh, for example, NAFTA is a great example. If you look at Mexico, I'm reading to you from the New York Times. Under NAFTA, as a result, 20 million Mexicans live in food poverty. 25% of the population does not have access to basic food, and one-fifth of Mexican children suffer from malnutrition. As the U.S. heavily subsidized corn and other staples poured into Mexico, producer prices dropped and small farmers found themselves unable to make a living. Some two million people have been forced from their farms, right? Mexico's not producing its own food. It's a captive market. It's importing American food, and it's devastated the country. Mexico is poor, and American agribusiness stays rich. That's capitalism. That's why we had the American Revolution. The British Empire was trying to tell us here in the United States that we couldn't develop our own industries. We had to buy from the British. And as a result, we had a revolution so that we could develop our own economy. And the same thing the British Empire was doing to us, uh, capitalism and the huge multinational corporations are doing around the world, keeping countries like Haiti, countries like Nigeria, countries like India, captive markets. And countries are constantly fighting to try and break out of this. And the socialist revolutions of the 20th century, they didn't happen in Western Europe, as Marx had predicted. They happened in the developing world because capitalism was keeping these countries as impoverished captive markets without their own industries, without their own economic growth, and keeping them as, as basically vassals, uh, as dependent states, client states that are impoverished and suffering. And socialism was those countries breaking out, planning their economy, and industrializing. Um, I, 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 like, um, because I talked with Kyle Kalinske about this. Um, I don't know. I would love to read where these bizarro anti-NAFTA studies are coming from. Um, I've seen like very pointed anti-NAFTA like propaganda that will hyper focus on like specific industries that say like, well, um, corn markets were disproportionately impacted in Mexico and so many jobs were lost here. But like Mexico was one of the large winners in NAFTA. And this is something that I've seen like universally heralded. Like exports oh. under uh, farm exports in, in Mexico. Well, you can't say sure to that. You just literally told me that NAFTA took a shit all over Mexico's economy. Wait, wait. Oh, so the New York Times agrees with me. The headline of the article is under NAFTA, Mexico suffered and the United States felt its pain. November 24th, 2013. I guess they're lying to, to hurt American capitalism. Or something. I'm sorry. Are you literally citing me an op ed to tell me that that opinion yes. piece is somehow reflective of the economic I'm citing census the on NAFTA? In it. Yes, I'm citing the statistics in that op ed. Yes. I'm citing something that even the New York Times admits that Mexico has been what? The New York very Times? badly hurt wait, by free trade. The New York yeah. Times is not an economic journal. Why are you telling me that even oh, okay. the New York Times? Also, well, wait, is this, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Wait a second. Is this article, it's the author of this article. Uh, the author is Laura Carlson. Wait, what is her background? Is this like, is this literally like an opinion piece or was this written it's like a statement an... against interest? The New York Times is a defender of Western capitalism. The fact that even they would admit what it has done to Mexico, I think is very strong. Or while we're while we're at it, um, I have the CIA World Factbook statistics of life expectancy in front of me. Cuba's life expectancy is 78.9 years. The Dominican Republic, another country in the Caribbean that's part of the Western capitalist system, 71 years. Jamaica, 74. Honduras, 71. Guyana, 68. Mexico, 76. Guatemala, 71. Haiti, 64. Come on. Right. Capitalism. Capitalism is the answer. Why are all these countries that are part of the free trade system are part of the global capitalist system impoverished? And Cuba, a country with a centrally planned economy, has achieved a much higher life expectancy. OK, I don't know about life expectancy. We're jumping onto a totally different argument. OK, um, so like it's okay. somebody linked me this article. So just reading it. Right. Like th this person literally says, like, damages were done to, like, Mexico's agricultural sector. It doesn't mention the massive gains made in the industrial sector. Um, hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs were created in Mexico. I think it's like 20 percent of car imports in the United States come from Mexico. These are jobs that paid citizens more money than the farming jobs that led to a greater industrialization in Mexico in these parts. Um, she literally in the next like paragraph of this article just says, well, as a result of some of these agricultural practices, 20 million Mexicans live in food poverty. That's not a causal link. Like how many Mexicans like th this is <laughs> they own their own farms before beforehand and now they're in food poverty they're not even producing their own food wait That's so you're telling me that prior so prior to nafta every citizen of mexico was well fed totally well nourished had all sorts of like no come on this is ridiculous this Carlson's article is that, that it made conditions worse and i think if you look at the narco drug infested chaos that's come involved in mexico 
If that were happening in Venezuela, we'd be told, see, socialism did it. But it happens in Mexico, and we're told, oh, you know, you know, you know. I've even had a lot of libertarians try to tell me that Mexico must be socialist because it's poor, right? Because everyone knows capitalism leads to prosperity. That's simply not the facts. Um, I, 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 like, I can't, um, I, we should, <laughs> I, I can't actually, like, um, I can't argue against a New York Times op-ed on this. Um, yeah, let's stay away from. I mean, let's like, stay away we, from we, doing I mean, that. Like, if you want, like, we can dig through because, like, I've read Times so many like law. That defends the free market system. The New York England. Times does not defend economic. Po I don't care what the New York Times says about the economic impact. Now, if like Krugman or somebody's like, or Krugman is writing an article or something talking about like his position, like I'm sure I'm interested in reading that. Or if Borjas is writing something on immigration and he submits an op-ed, but random like people writing articles in the New York Times, I'm going to appeal to like the wider studies that look at like NAFTA's economic impact. Um, or we can read things from like the Council of Foreign Relations. Or we can read things that are published in like different economic journals to see like the actual impact. I'm like appealing to a single opinion article I, on the New York I Times. Think, I think that people throughout those sources you listed would would agree about the conditions in many of the capitalist countries of the world. I mean, this is the CIA World Factbook. I just read you the life expectancies throughout the countries nearby what do you think Cuba that and compared them. What? What does that prove? What does life expectancy prove? What is? Oh, yeah, right. Who cares if people die sooner? I mean, oh, okay, all right. It doesn't matter, right? Life expectancy, who cares about that? Wait, right? what do you think okay. I just asked? Wait, what was the question I just asked? You said, what does life expectancy prove? Okay, do you think that means I want people to die early? No, but apparently you're saying it doesn't matter how long people live, right? No, what I'm asking you is, what do you think... You know, what I'm I asking you is what you when you're improving people's life expectancy and their access to health care and their quality of life, that's a good thing. But it, what does it prove? Oh, OK, what does it prove? Well, what I'm saying is that just because you see an increase in life, we're going around in circles here. <laughs> Honestly, uh, so, I, I don't know if we should keep going. I mean, we're just kind of repeating ourselves. But okay, I, just, so just as a quick thing, just because life expectancy improves one, that's not even necessarily reflective of positive underlying things. And two, it doesn't necessarily mean you can attribute it solely to like an economic organization or a particular government. So, for example, one country might have access to more food than another country. That country might become more obese, and you might see a decrease in their life expectancy. Type 2 diabetes can lead to anywhere from a 7 to 13-year decrease on your lifespan, right? So if you were to compare the life expectancy of two countries like that, this is just one example out of 50 trillion potential hypotheticals. Maybe the increase in immigration to the United States, the lower average life expectancy of, say, African Americans or Hispanic people are keeping the life expectancy of the United States down compared to other socialist countries. Um, just appealing to one stat and saying, well, the life expectancy in Cuba is higher than the life expectancy in the United States, that, that doesn't prove anything. So when I ask, like, well, what does that mean? That stat me is totally well, meaningless. I don't think Cuba's life expectancy is higher than the United States. I think it's pretty close, but I don't think it's it's higher. I'm, I'm reading to you from The Guardian, uh, November 27th, 2016, quote, Cuba's literacy rate is at 100 percent and its life expectancy parallels first world nations, despite limited funding and supplies. The country's ratio of doctors to patients, its proactively community-centered approach to healthcare, has long been the envy of Western countries, not the least the UK. I think that's an example of central planning improving people's lives. Okay. Um, okay. I, I I don't think so, but it's I guess it's another. Okay. I have some questions well, from chat if we want to do that for a second. Okay. So. Sure. Go um, for it. Uh, Caleb, uh, what do you think about the importance of making sure the state is under working class control under socialism? Well, I think that is absolutely necessary. And that I will say that I don't equate mere state ownership with socialism. Saudi Arabia, for example, almost everything's run by the government, but the government simply facilitates the making of profits by the Saudi royal family. Uh, the Asian tigers, there's a very heavy amount of state control, Singapore, Taiwan, countries like that, but it's facilitating the making of profits. The economy simply funks and functions for the benefit of a small group of capitalists. Um, they simply have a heavy state involvement in it. Um, socialism is when you have a state apparatus that is not working on behalf of capital, which is rooted in communities. Um, you know, the Communist Party has 90 million members in China. I've seen the Bolivarian circles that exist in, in Venezuela. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, in Cuba, they have the committees to defend the revolution and that, that these are states that come out of a mass mobilization of the population and the mass movement and bringing in of people into the political process. And uh, and I think that state ownership in and of itself is not the definition of socialism. It's it's a state that controls the means of production. I think that's the difference. OK, another question from Maupin. 
Uh, can we really have Chinese style control of the economy without Chinese style oppression of citizens? I'd be scared of Trump being able to say what a business can do. This, this is a big question I have too. It's like my, one of my fears with socialism is it's it's going to require an authoritarian government that might have too much oversight, um, and then we could end up with what we've seen in Russia or China. What would your response to that be? Well, I I I share a lot of the concerns people have about China. I do think. You know, and I, I do want to point out, and I um, I do want to point out that you know not everything we necessarily hear in American media, you know, is the whole story. Uh, there's a great article from the Washington Post about you know China's social credit system and how some of the reporting may not have been completely balanced and accurate about it. Um, but at the same time, I share your concerns, and we have to remember that these are countries that are part of the developing world, and they're building socialism under extremely hostile conditions. Uh, they're being invaded. They're they're fighting for their lives, and they have a very authoritarian political model as a result of that. And I don't believe the American people would ever accept a socialist society that didn't grant them the right to free speech and the right to freedom of, of assembly and freedom of religion. I don't think the American people would ever accept that. Um, but it's a concern, and it's a fair concern, right? Um, the scary thing is, though, you can see authoritarianism and capitalism all over the place. Saudi Arabia is a capitalist country. They still cut off people's heads in public. Right. Um, I mean, you know, take a look at South Korea's national security laws. You can go to prison in South Korea. A young man, I believe, did go to prison for retweeting Kim Jong uh, Kim Jong Il. Um, and that, that authoritarianism is something that ev that societies implement in response to hostile conditions. Um, and human rights are, are something we should all be striving for. And and let me add that, you know, the notion that human rights are separated from economy. Um, is a dangerous notion, right? No one was talking about human rights until like 1400s in Europe, right? The notion of, a, of, a, of an elected government and things like that. We started to see it some in Greece and Rome, but ultimately, you know, the rights of man and all that. People weren't just evil until then, but try to run a subsistence economy at the level of development they had in feudalism where everyone can say whatever they want and think whatever they want and have whatever religion they want wouldn't work out too well. That as prosperity increases and as people's economic conditions increase, the level of freedom also increases. And China is a lot more free um, in terms of, of freedom of religion, in terms of freedom of speech than they were during the Mao era. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that they have rapidly industrialized since that time and that they are a much more prosperous society. When the government is secure and it's not facing an onslaught of people that want to violently overthrow it, when there is a higher level of prosperity, you generally get more freedom. Now, that's not a perfect rule, and there's many exceptions to that. But I, I think that the, the way out of not just not just the issue with human rights, but a lot of the problems we have, the way out of addressing them is, is with development, that prosperity. When you get rid of poverty, you can also get rid of drug gangs. You can also get rid of terrorism. And that there is an economic component to a lot of the problems plaguing the world. And a lot of the problems that socialist countries have had has been based on the fact that they're facing a level of scarcity. They also tend to be facing a level of, you know, imperialist attack. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, that, that they everything they did was right. I'm not going to sit here and deny that things that shouldn't have happened happened. And uh, but I think that human rights and economic development are fundamentally tied. Real quick. So just because I, because I, it sucks because I don't know, like, every random fact, um, j j like, Fuck, there's so much stuff that I let slide. So, like, er earlier when we talked about, like, the, the great successes of Cuba, right? So the Cuban life expectancy is 79.74 years. And then we talk about the horrendous Mexico that's been looted and destroyed by capitalism. Their life expectancy is 77.12 years, right? There's, like, less than a three-year difference in life expectancy between these countries. This is one of the reasons why I say pointing to single stats doesn't really prove, like, any particular story. But it's still lower than Cuba's, correct? By two and a half years. Okay. Okay. So, firstly... Um, Secondly, I, the earlier Mexico's you mentioned not facing a huge blockade, right? It's not it's not impossible to ship medicine into Mexico. Uh, you know, uh, the amount of you know the amount of economic embargo. There's not sanctions on Mexico, right? I mean, the fact that Mexico, you know, and still, you know, a free market country that that's supposed to have the greatest system in the world of free trade, still can't even do better than Cuba raises some questions. But okay. Continue. Well, I mean, Mexico's, you know, doctors also aren't becoming taxi drivers to make money because the state doesn't provide them with any. Um, I don't know if I'm going to believe Cuba's 100% yeah, well, literacy rates. Cuban, ta also, taxi drivers um, are are become, uh, Cuban doctors are becoming taxi drivers is because the government has trained a lot of people to become doctors. They have actually, Ban Ki-moon called it the greatest, uh, what is it, the greatest, the world's most advanced, I'm sorry, the world's most advanced medical school. And that's one thing the Cuban government has subsidized a lot is training people to become doctors. There's a lot of people who are doctors and they're not actually, you know, you know, they don't have a place for them in the medical system. 
Um, and as a it's result, kind of bizarre that, that like... Iran actually has a very sure, similar sure. problem. It's pretty um, crazy that so many of their people are doctors and they've done all these amazing things. And in the United States, which has so many problems with healthcare, our life expectancy is like a year within the, the Cubans. We're a fully industrialized country that has been industrialized for hundreds of years. Uh, I think there's a bit of a difference there. Cuba was an impoverished colony uh, for a long time and, and it's broken free and it's had huge achievements. <laughs> I totally agree with you. Do you notice how you try to cite a single stat to defend like a broader economic argument? But anytime I point out, <laughs> that's what you do when you're arguing. Anytime I point, anytime I point, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I, I should have had their entire, entire, the entire analysis of the country and read it all. No, to you. Dude, I mean, that's not what you fair. do when you're no, arguing. No, 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 no. What you're doing is you'll cite like one number, like it proves a point. Like, when I asked you earlier, I very specifically asked you, I said, what does life expectancy matter, right? And, and I guess you heard it as like, well, I like it when people live longer. But no, but my point was- No, that, I heard it as you questioning no, no, that no, life expectancy finish is important. my point, man, one point. You've talked for 90% of the conversation, okay? What my, destiny my point is that like, you can't just cite one number and say that that's indicative of like the overall health of a country. That's absurd. Sure. And then when I point that's out fair. that your number, when you look into the other numbers, doesn't even work, now you're ready to back up into, oh, well, hold on. Well, there's more differences, okay? America is more industrialized. Cuba has had a blockade. It's like, well, okay. So anytime the numbers don't work in your favor, now context is incredibly important. Now we need to back up and look at the whole picture. But anytime you can just like throw like one number, and I notice this, like socialists do this all the time. They play like really fast and loose with like particular facts. If you feel like you can throw one out and it works, you'll do it. But anytime I call into question a, a stat or figure, well, now we need to look at the greater context. Well, there's a reason why America, even though we kill ourselves all the time and we're killing ourselves with, with drugs and fentanyl, and even though we do this, we still have a greater life expectancy. Well, that's because there's a broader reason for it. Now, I don't disagree with you that there are broader reasons for these things, which is why I laughed when you cited life expectancy as some mark of progress for a country. I'm sure that we can find lots of countries that have better life expectancy in the U.S. that aren't more advanced in a multitude of ways. Um, but that, yeah, that was the only thing I pointed out. Also, what, the um, you made a claim a long time ago that the opium wars resulted in, I don't know if you said hundreds of millions or millions of deaths. Um, the only thing I've ever seen in regard to this is like 18 to 20,000 killed and wounded. I'm just curious what, where uh, that millions uh, of deaths uh, number came from. Well... First of all, as to what you were saying before, um, I think that I was saying that the context actually makes my point even truer. The fact that, that Cuba's life expectancy is on par with a fully industrialized country is a big achievement. Um, the second thing about the opium wars, uh, that was, I believe, recently in an article and, and in some Chinese government sources who were talking not just about the deaths in terms of on the battlefield, but the result of opium being imported into the country, the result of them not being able to develop their, their industries, the famines that came out as a result. I mean, it was an overall estimate. You know, these, these estimates that you cite about 100 gajillion million people died, they're based on this famine happened. They're based on these people weren't able to procreate. They're based on a lot more. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 not of food shortages. Am I correct? They're, they're estimates based on the results of, of not having food, the results, the, it's the results of the famine overall. It's not just people who- Why didn't they have food? Not people who died in a war. That's my only point. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's didn't have you're food looking at the, the overall results of- People stop farming That's to industrialize the country, which is one of the great points. They industrialized real fast. They did it at the cost of losing a lot of their agriculture. And then the, and the country stepped in and stole food from some of the countries, tried to murder the people leaving, and left a lot of them to starve to death because the central planning failed in terms of allocating resources to its citizens. Um, I believe by the 1970s, the Soviet Union had quite a strong agricultural system, if I'm not mistaken. And then my understanding also <laughs> is that during the fall of the Soviet Union, when they broke apart the state central plan, the Soviet farming system, you know, the, closed their doors. And that now in Russia, they're having a big farming boom because the Putin government is subsidizing small farmers to open up and, and they're creating a huge amount of government farms now. Um, that's my understanding. But I mean, I guess you're, you're arguing that the entire experience of, of Soviet agriculture was just miserable failures and famines the whole time. I don't think that's fair. Uh, okay. I don't think I said that. But, okay, I know. Uh, I know. Okay. I, I mean, also, I, you, um, I, yeah, sure. We also mentioned something about like a South Korean student being thrown in jail for tweeting something or whatever, the North Korean stuff. Yes, the national security laws, which Human Rights Watch have criticized, many, many mainstream I mean, observers have criticized national security laws in South Korea. But yeah.
Sure. Talk about like it. earlier, you talked about how like there weren't a lot of like blatant Nazis in Germany, right? Because Germany is like pretty strict in terms of like controlling like what type of Nazi you know messages can be like even for video games. I think they might have just recently reversed that. Um, but like even for video games, you can't have like Nazi symbolism or whatever, right? South Korea has similar laws for like worshiping or propagandizing or whatever, like the North Korean government as well. Right. Uh, sure. Whether you're not you're for or against it, I, it's really strange. So my point in raising that was that authoritarianism can exist in capitalism also. That was my only point. Sure, but also in, in other forms as well. Like, for instance, when North Korea locks people in prisons who are visiting and then kills them and then sends them back to their other countries like a year later, like what happened to that one kid that was visiting. Um, so, I mean, like th this like goes back to my earlier point that these types of like horrible actions can exist independent of economic systems. Exactly, that, um, and that's my point as well. No, that's so, my point. <laughs> yeah, well, we're agreeing, right? That 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 bad things have happened in socialist countries, bad things have happened in capitalist countries, but blaming every bad thing in the Soviet Union on socialism, and then whenever it happens in capitalism, saying, "Oh, but that's a, 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 it happened because of the oh, well, there's a bad leader or something like that." Well, no, I I just the, the way that these things are discussed, I don't know any person who would deny that these bad things have happened. You know, maybe they would disagree about the details about some of them, but I'm not here to do that. Um, but I don't know anyone who would deny that these things have happened, but the notion that it's always because of socialism, if it happens in a socialist country, and if it happens under capitalism, well, it's because well, no, it's not true capitalism. Or, yeah, you, you, you had these arguments, right? Problems in capitalism yeah, but like, the are not difference because of is capitalism. That, like, Every death in the Soviet Union from the time of 1917 to 1991 was purely caused by Stalin and communism. That, is a, that, that narrative is, is inconsistent. The difference is we have to be a little bit more honest when we look at why certain people die or why certain things happen under economic sure. systems. I so in the United you. States, when somebody goes to the hospital and they can't afford to get some test to screen for cancer and then they later die of it because they didn't catch it early enough, this is a failure of capitalism. We have the resources. They're literally right there and the person can't access it. Okay, That is 100% right. a failure of capitalism. When you have a people who are told to stop farming and then food isn't rationed to them and all of their crops are requisitioned by the central government as a part of central planning, and then those people starve, three and a half to seven and a half million of them, that is a failure of central planning, of socialism or communism. Do you agree? Or do you think that these two things are fundamentally different? I would agree. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I, I would was... also agree that when Soviet agriculture was mechanized and got tractors and industrialized and, and its successes were also a success of central planning. But yeah, if, when it failed and when it, when it had problems, that was a failure of central planning. I know many people are critical of the agricultural policies. In the 1920s, during the new economic policy, the Soviet government was pushing peasant enrich yourself and was promoting private farming. Then later, they rapidly collectivized, very, very rapidly, and, and promoted collective farming. And it was a zigzag that was very dramatic. And I've heard very strong criticisms of that. I don't, I, I'm not an expert, I'm not a Soviet okay. historian. If you um, want to take credit for oh, stuff yeah, like I mean, that, sure. In central planning, if, if, the, if that's how we're going to play that, that like the development of that country, like then I'm, then I'm going to say that all of that agricultural development that took place in the USSR, that was actually a success of capitalism because the tractor was invented in America in the late 1800s. So actually all well, the tractors actually, that the that USSR- point, like, I read to you earlier about how the Soviet Union was producing more tractors than the United States at that point in their state-run factories. So Sure, I, but it was yeah. off of a US invention off of a capitalist country's invention. Okay, so. okay, okay. So now, if if a system invents something, that that's a, that's an argument in its favor. Where was the first cell phone invented? Oh, I don't know. Let's check. 1957 in the Soviet Union. Using like satellite technology and everything that we no. have today. No, the first mobile phone ever created was in 1957 Wait, by okay, Soviet engineer Leonid Ivanovich Kaprianovich. So I, I okay, so I could be wrong here, but I invented I'm the AK forty seven rifle, the most efficient weapon and you know, the most efficient gun, I should say. Right? Um it's efficient space not about killing people. There's a reason why we, we don't use AK forty sevens today. Um <clears throat> yeah, because the M sixteens break and, and then we can sell more. It's the military industrial complex. The AK forty seven is a much more efficient weapon. Well, because the caliber is more lethal as well. 5.56 is superior to the 7.62 of the battle rifle rounds or whatever. The, yeah, the, they, they break. They're not durable. You can run over an AK with a tank and it still works. And I don't think that most efficient. rifles need to be field tested to be ran over by tanks. <laughs> let's, not, let's not get caught up in the gun debate because this can go too many different ways. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> well, like maybe, we, could, maybe. We, we could argue right. like about, yeah. Like, the Soviet Union about, like, even had a home computer system in 1985. Now, the USA already had a home computer system, but they developed their own without technology, with a treaty, the NATO treaty, barring them from getting any technology from the West. I mean, 
the, the notion that central planning economies can't create inventions, can't advance technology is false. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily disagree with that. I think that these types of innovations can come from a lot of different places, sure. Um, I, it's just, it's very strange how we decide, like, what we take credit for versus what we give, like, what we don't take credit for. I, I don't know. It just, I it haven't denied any place atrocities me, but... here. Okay. Right. okay. I have to get a super chat question in here unless you guys want to keep going back and forth on that. Um, so this is for Destiny. Also, oh, wait, real quick, just on, on, yep, on the go ahead. part of that. Apparently in 1949, AT&T was the first company to commercialize, like, mobile telephone services. I don't know, like, where the idea, which, who in the USSR, did they do this earlier, or? Uh, I, I've seen it cited many places that in 1950, 57, the Soviet engineer Leonid Ivanovich Kaprianovich invented the first mobile phone. I've seen that many places. You're disputing that. I mean, I, 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 I can see it disputed. It's been disputed. I mean, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that goes, you know, we're always told that under socialism, no one ever invents anything because the only people, reason people invent things is because of capitalism and all of that. And I think that spits in the face of that. And there's many Soviet inventions. I, th I believe LED lights were also invented in the Soviet Union. Okay. Um, okay, Destiny, it's, anything? Let's do the super chat question. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. We've gone almost two mm -hmm. hours now, so I yeah. think, think I've got to wrap this up. But let's do the super chat question. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, so it. this is for you, Destiny. Under NAFTA, Mexican miners such as in Escueta, Sonora, for example, export their local gold to Americans for a virtual minimum wage. Do more jobs mean a better economy? Um, generally, increased trade liberalization is usually correlated with a better economy, uh, but you have to make sure that the gains that your economy is making is compensating people for the losses that are happening in specific sectors. This is something that we've tried to do a lot in the United States, and we've generally failed at it. Um, so, for instance, we push for things like job retraining programs and whatnot, but generally it doesn't work. Um, so, for instance, like in NAFTA, certain manufacturing sectors were hurt, other manufacturing sectors open. The people that lose their jobs tend to have a, far, uh, a hard time finding replacement work. So this is something that still needs to be addressed. So I would expect that the same things happen in Mexico as well. A lot of jobs open up in manufacturing there that didn't exist before. These jobs are superior to a lot of the agricultural ones they had. However, the people that lost those agricultural jobs are basically fucked. They need something. There has to be something to help them out. And the goal should be that if your economy is overall making gains due to an increase in liberalization of trade, you're finding ways to redistribute these gains to the people that are disproportionately impacted by the losses that are happening in specific sectors of your economy. So for instance, let's say that you open up a manufacturing plant in Mexico, and now you're making a ton of cars for the United States and those people are getting awesome jobs, you should probably be taxed a little bit and that money should be sent to people whose jobs were lost as a result of the liberalization of that trade. Okay. Um, that's, this is a question I have for you. What is your uh, measure for quality of life in a country? Um, that, man, that's really hard. Um, the HDI, there's like the Human Development Index. Some people try to measure it more broadly using psychological terms. Um he, he, development it's I don't, I don't have a good answer for that okay. it's a really that's hard fine. one i don't know that's fine um yeah um, i mean like you, you can measure like access to like basic goods so like do you have access to like housing mm -hmm. um like food like nourishing food not like junk shit food um <clears throat> things like the internet like there are a lot of like basic rights we can check for there but yeah that, but that's a really hard to overall measure like the uh the uh, improvement of a country or the development of a country is a really difficult thing to do okay um well can i say something on that yeah go ahead um well, one index that I'm not necessarily saying this is the best index is the World Happiness Index. Um, and I believe Jeffrey Sachs, the economist who I have very strong disagreements with, is, is, is responsible for the World Happiness Index. But I have in my hand here actually uh, their report from 2016. And it lists the greatest increase in happiness as happening in Nicaragua under the leadership of the Sandinista government, um, the you know that has had a huge amount of economic growth and investment coming in from China. And if you compare uh, the World Happiness Index and other indexes uh, of Nicaragua with a socialist planned economy to free market countries like Guatemala, like Honduras, uh, there have been some pretty big economic achievements in Nicaragua under the FSLN government. Um, and I, I just think since we're talking about that, it's relevant to bring that up, that, that the World Happiness Index, Jeffrey Sachs, no less, who's associated with neoliberalism, now I understand he's more more social democratic, but uh, you know he lists the greatest increase in happiness in 2016 as being in Nicaragua. Okay. Um, that, well, I mean, that might be true, but that doesn't really mean anything, right? It could be that Nicaragua's happiness, for instance, prior to um, some economic forms was incredibly depressed compared to other countries. If every country in the world that's capitalist has like massively high like happiness indexes, then you would expect to see the greatest gains always made by developing nations, regardless of economic system, right? Fair enough. Okay. Uh, Radical Reviewer. Hey, Radical Reviewer has a question for Destiny. 
Uh, Destiny, inventions rely on military scientists, research and development grants, et cetera, public funding. Can we really credit capitalism for these inventions? Um, you can't really credit capitalism for it. There's a lot of like baseline research that isn't profitable. There's a lot of really fucking good research that happens that there's not like money to be made off of. And you would never expect a market to solve for things like this. So a lot of like the groundwork research has to be publicly funded. There has to be some public funding that goes to universities for types of research, right? Like the internet being based off of early military stuff. Um, um, there, there's like a multitude of inventions like medical and technological that rely on everything that came from our space program, like GPS satellites and everything. A lot of this is, has like the backs off of public funding. It seems like what capitalists are able to do is they can take like some public funding concept, they can bring in outside investors, and then they can build a product that you can actually sell to consumers, right? Like an average person is never logging on to, to, to DARPAnet to play World of Warcraft. That takes somebody that wants to make money to get outside invest. Well, I mean, it could theoretically happen in a public sense, but right now in the United States, under a capitalistic sense, outside money comes in, funds investment, because people think that they can sell a product that consumers will want to buy. Um, yeah. Okay, Destiny, what is... What is your utopian society? This is a question for the super chat. Um, my a utopian society. Um, I guess it would be there would be some baseline of things that every person should have. Um, and then there'd be like a baseline of time that every person should have. Uh, personally, I think it's really fucking sad when people have to work more than like 40 hours a week and even 40 might be pushing it. So people that have to work two jobs, people that have to work crazy weird hours, um, <clears throat> like, like overnights or changing every week, like being able to provide like a steady source of income to people is good. People should have healthcare. You should never have to make a decision on whether or not to do like a certain test because you don't have money for it. That's insanely fucked. People should have access to quality, affordable food. Um, I don't know if I'm brought up housing. Obviously, the fact that we have like homeless people in any part of the United States is very fucking weird that you can go to San Francisco, the richest city in the world almost, and walk outside of Starbucks and see literally mentally retarded people screaming at people that are just like homeless. That's insane to me. Um, so I, I mean, like any type of utopia would be one that can allocate resources in a way to solve these problems. I just typically choose to reallocate resources off the backs of a successful economic system through like taxation rather than saying the economic system itself should solve those problems because I don't think that's possible. That's yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll do the last super chat question for Destiny, and then I'll let you guys get your final statements. Destiny. Oh. Okay. Do you love black people? Yeah, nice meme. <laughs> okay. All right, memes aside, uh, go ahead, uh, Caleb. I'll let you go first with your closing statements, and then Destiny, you can go. Well, you know, I, I think it's interesting. I, I don't know the meme. I'm not hip to the internet culture as much as I should be, but um, it is interesting to note that you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr who is on the U.S. citizenship test. What's one of the questions they ask if you become a U.S. citizen? Who was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Well, he and him himself, in the final years of his life, did advocate some form of democratic socialism. He said there is something wrong with capitalism. And I think that we can learn from what went on in the 20th century. You know, I don't think that every person who drives a Japanese car is responsible for the crimes of Japan during the Second World War. And I think that, that, that socialism has resulted in countries that were deeply poor becoming global superpowers. I think capitalism and the rule of profits is causing big problems here in the United States. And I think, as I've said many times on my YouTube lives that I do every week with a growing audience, that we need a government of action to fight for working families. And I think that science and human creativity need to be unleashed and that the greed and irrationality of profits is getting in the way of that. And I would like to see a new global economy emerge in which, you know, it was based on win-win cooperation, which instead of impoverishing countries to enrich huge multinational corporations, countries were trading with each other in a way that was mutually beneficial. I'm worried about the military industrial complex and the prison industrial complex. I'm worried about big opioid corporations making profits from getting people addicted. I'm worried about the irrationality of the market. And I'd like to see a, a society come into existence where the market and profits we're not in control, but human reason and and uh, the collective benefit of the country was given priority. We could have a market sector, sure, but the means of production would ultimately be forced to work in the interest of society. That's how I see things. And I, I like, again, I'll repeat, Steve, I like what you're doing here. Stephen, I'm sorry, Stephen. I like what you're doing here. I'm glad you had me on here. You know, it's been a good discussion and, uh, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, keep engaging with people all over the political process. You are what we need now more than ever. This kind of engagement where we're actually talking about what we think, we're comparing our ideas, I believe this is the cure to a lot of the problems we have in the United States of America. So thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure. 
Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Caleb. Uh, go ahead, Stephen. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Caleb. I appreciate the conversation. Um, I mean, like my basic talking points are the same as they always have been. I don't think that an economic system um, should deal in, in morality. Um, economic systems should just be as efficient and as <clears throat> um, as efficient as possible. Um, resources should be allocated in ways that grow the economy the most as possible. If you want to like make moral prescriptions, if you want to say people should have healthcare, people should have housing, that should be done on the policy side of the government. If people want to make a fuck ton of money off of housing, doing crazy unethical shit, let them do it, but tax the fuck out of it for do it. Use the money, spend it on Section 8 housing, find a way to give it to people so that they can buy houses, let your economy function the best as possible, take the winnings off that economy and distribute it to the people that need it the most. I think that's the way that you grow the biggest economy. It's the way that you get the biggest public budgets to spend the money on the people that need it the most. And that's always been my position, and it'll always continue to be my position until I see like some massive, successfully like socially planned, or, or I'm sorry, centrally planned system work. Okay, awesome. All right, to everybody in the chat, thank you for watching. Destiny, Maupin, thank you for coming. Uh, so uh, I like having these debates because they're fun. I learn a lot from them. Uh, but if anybody that doesn't know who I am, I work on a project where we try to de-radicalize people from extremist movements. I was featured in an article on the front page of the New York Times. So please go check out our Discord channel if you'd like to help de-radicalize people out of extremist movements or if you have any resources or um, talents that you can offer. So thank you guys for coming and everybody have a good day. Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate being here. Yep. Bye.